Are you searching for the best in online black radio? Then go to blacktalkradionetwork.com, helping you filter through the noise. Real talk, black talk. The internet is full of half-truths and all-out lies. We've all seen them, and many people on social media complaining about it. Here's your chance to show and prove. WorldAfropedia.com is a black-owned and operated encyclopedia. There are several thousand articles, but we need help. We can't uncover all the truth ourselves. So please, join us and become a writer, editor, or blogger for WorldAfropedia.com today. Every little bit counts. We owe it to the future generations to put the truth out there. Visit worldafropedia.com, the African-centered encyclopedia, a global database of African knowledge for the purpose of bringing about global African wisdom and understanding. Worldafropedia.com. So something, that means that something is wrong with our conceptualization about the problem. See, like I have a sister who's in Chicago, very sick in the hospital. And the big question, what is wrong? What, you know, in other words, she's having these symptoms. But the big question for the doctors to determine is, what is going on that is causing See, not just the symptoms, but what is causing. And so this is where this question, why is this stuff happening? The New York Times article, I mean editorial today. The Trump effect. See, this is what I'm doing with my money, buying newspapers like Dick Gregory. (laughs) The Trump effect and how it spreads. It says we are on the brink, under under Trump, on the brink of fascism. (laughs) New York Times, all the news that's fit to print, editorial 1210-2015. I say fascism is end-stage white supremacy. So you see, I mean, just like in Nazi Germany. Fascism, system of racism, white supremacy, determined to survive. The cows context of white supremacy, Gusty Renegade in for another broadcast, hopefully to share constructive information on the system of white supremacy today's date. Tuesday, March, excuse me, Wednesday, got confused, March 28th, 2018. So I have been told always great uh, to hear the wisdom of Dr. Frances Cress Welsing uh, for a broadcast. Uh, keep her thoughts, uh, commentary in mind as we proceed this evening. I remind folks again, we'll be here tomorrow for Workplace Racism, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Uh, we are talking about the bombings that have been taking place in Austin, Texas. Uh, Earlier this month, uh, the bombing suspect, Mark Anthony Condit, a 23-year-old white male, uh, he has allegedly deceased, allegedly blew himself up in a confrontation with enforcement officials. We'll be discussing that uh, this evening. Just wanted to make sure uh, the two victims of white supremacy who died in this attack Anthony House, a 39-year-old black male. Uh, Draylon Mason, a 17-year-old black male. Uh, just to make sure I recognize the two fatalities. There were uh, four others injured in the attack as well. Also, make sure I remind our listeners, uh, our guest, Dr. Jensen, he will only be with us uh, for about an hour. So if you have a question, do not lollygag. Don't you know? wait around. Go ahead and get your hand up early. If you think you have a question, you think uh, maybe I don't have a question now, but one might come to me because I'm interested in this subject matter. Go ahead, dial in and get your hand up. The number is 641-715-3640. The code 
pound. Press star six one. If you have a question, I'll give out the number again as we proceed. Uh, returning his fourth time, I think, on the broadcast, you can go back in the archives and hear some of his uh, previous giz- uh, previous visits. Uh, we had some great exchanges. Uh, he is the author of The End of Patriarchy, Radical Feminism for Men. Uh, he also wrote The Heart of Whiteness, Confronting Race, Racism, and White Privilege. Uh, we've discussed that second book uh, a few times on the broadcast. Over the years, uh, he is a professor of journalism at the University of Texas, Austin, why well, I wanted to have him on the program joining us for the fourth time, our guest, Dr. Robert Jensen. Dr. Jensen, are you with us, sir? Yes, I am. Outstanding. Thank you so much for visiting with us. Glad to have you back uh, on the program. Uh, for people who might not be aware of you, have not seen you, you are a white male. Is that correct, sir? I am. I'm about as white as it gets. I'm originally from the state of North Dakota. So, yep, um, I am white. No doubt about that. Okay. Uh, we will try to cover as much as we can in the time that we uh, have you. Uh, you you are in Austin, Texas right now. Is that correct, sir? That is correct, yep. Okay. And how long have you been a resident in the area? I moved here in 1992 to take a, the job I currently hold at the University of Texas at Austin. So this is coming up on the end of 26 years in Austin for me. Wow. Okay. So you been there enough to, you know, have some sense of the town and how it's evolved over the past quarter century or so. Uh, Just can you give us a bit of of background information about this town, like the the demographics, some of the history, particularly I was thinking with regards to white supremacy, racism, their 1928 segregation plan. And also, if you could kind of touch on, because I think Austin, uh, the little bit that people know about it is kind of thought of as a progressive city, whatever that means, if you could kind of touch on that briefly. Sure. Austin uh, is the state capital and home to the University of Texas, which is the flagship campus of, of the system. Um, it uh, probably it has been best known as the home to a certain kind of uh, country music. Originally, it was called outlaw country. There's a lot of music and film and video production here. So to the degree Austin is known outside of Texas, it's as a a center of cultural production. We have an annual South by Southwest film, video, music, interactive uh, conference that draws tens of thousands of people. So Austin is known as uh, a kind of hipster place. Uh, sometimes people call us the Portland of the Southwest. Sometimes people call Portland the Austin of the Pacific Northwest. It's that kind of town. But as you point out, uh, for all its progressive politics and, and, and progressive is, is an accurate account in some ways, especially compared to the rest of Texas, which is an extremely conservative state, of course. But as you point out, Austin has a very troubled racial history and present. So uh, when it was a sleepy little town, uh, the black population was spread in various parts of town. But as the town grew, and you point out in the 1920s, this was actually solidified in a master plan, uh, there was a, uh, the beginning of a concerted effort to push black and eventually brown folks into a particular area. Uh, and that ended up being east of the interstate highway that was eventually built. So when I moved to Austin in 1992, it was well known that East Austin, east of the interstate highway, was primarily black and brown and disproportionately less wealthy that West Austin, west of the interstate, was predominantly white, not exclusively, of course, but predominantly white and economically um, wealthier. And that was the state of being when I got to town. Uh, The only change in that, in some sense, has been through gentrification, that as Austin has grown, and the population of the city has doubled in the time I've lived here. Uh, Of course, the race for property, especially property in the center city, um, gets more competitive, and eventually the part of town that to the predominantly white population had se- had been seen as kind of a no-go zone. East Austin was black and brown. You didn't buy houses there if you were white, that kind of thing. Eventually, of course, gentrification took hold, as it does in cities, not just Austin. And so that has been part of the racial mix as well. So today, Austin still has this reputation as kind of a liberal city, but it's a deeply segregated city. Um, a lot of the historic residents of East Austin uh, 
have been pushed out by rising property values, property taxes, and the general process we call gentrification. And I would say it's only within the last few years that that white Austin, the, the dominant power structure in, structure in Austin, has really even begun to openly talk about this. There has been some movement on that recently, uh, but it's still at a, a city that in some ways mirrors the problems of the United States. It's even decades after the legal achievements of the civil rights movement, it's still highly segregated. The school system is still um, highly unequal in the quality of schools, depending on what part of town you're in. Um, and these tensions have not gone away. Uh, the only positive, I suppose, is that they're finally being talked about in a much more open way. Mm. Context of white supremacy, double entendre there. These things do not happen accidentally. Context is important. Were you there uh, when the bombing started at the beginning of this month, I believe, March 2nd? Where, oh, and Dr. Uh, Jensen did say that he was out of town. It's not like he's been in Austin every single day following you know, everything about the events. He did uh, have some time away, uh, travel time away. Uh, that's it. Yeah. It, it started during spring break week, and I was traveling, in, and so it was kind of an odd experience to be out of town but reading about what was happening. But I, I don't have a sense of what, you know, the mood on the street was. I was gone for the, the period when it was most intense. Um, but, of course, monitoring the, the news about it uh, and, and listening a lot since I've been back to people talking about it. Uh, but it was certainly um, one of the most tense moments in Austin since I've been here by all accounts. Do you have fam like since you were kind of out of town, it was spring break and what have you, do you have family there that you were concerned about? Were you out of town or? No, actually uh, I married, my wife was out of town at the same time. Uh, I don't have any other, uh, you know, my own family, but my wife's family's here. And, and it, you know, the, the whole sort of threat of random violence is, that there is no predicting it. Um, but the town is also quite large. So I think people's levels of fear vary widely. And that's true, you know, in general. Um, you know, there are lots of threats in the modern world. As people often point out, just getting in a car and driving on the highway is a threat. But um, so I didn't feel that myself, but I know other people did. And it, it's, I think, kind of a personal thing. Um, at the beginning, of course, the first two bombings were in East Austin, and there was an understandable, uh, great, much greater level of tension on the east side because the first two victims were African-American. Uh, the first and only two deaths were African-American. And um, they both had some connections to the leadership of the black community. Uh, and so it wasn't um, hard to imagine that this was a targeted racial attack. It turned out not necessarily to be that. I think there's still a lot left to, to know about this. There's um, obviously an investigation going on. There's a lot that's not known about the motives of the bomber. Uh, but the subsequent bombs were, were placed in a predominantly white part of town. Um, it doesn't mean the bomber didn't have racial motivations. Um, from whatever you know, evidence he left behind, it doesn't seem clear. Now, of course, law enforcement's continuing to investigate, and you have three different levels. You have the Austin Police Department, you have state law enforcement, and you have the FBI. So there's a lot of law enforcement involved in this, and I expect we will be learning more as time goes on. But um, certainly at the beginning, the, the black community in Austin, in East Austin especially, uh, was uh, living under the threat that there was a targeted uh, racial motivation to this, and, and that was certainly probably the, the most uneasy part of the, the bombers, the period the bomber was at large. Context of white supremacy with Dr. Robert Jensen. Uh, you were reading a lot of material, and you're in the School of Journalism, so reading uh, mm -hmm. and studying uh, the media coverage of these events. Do you get a sense uh, in terms of the first two bombs, as you mentioned, they were in East Austin, uh, non-white areas of town designed deliberately to be so by racist white supremacists. Uh, do you get a sense of how the response was handled to those first two bombs uh, that were in East Austin, as opposed to hypothetically how you can speculate a response would have unfolded if this had happened at the South by Southwest Festival, which was just this month? 
Well, everything that happens at South by Southwest is magnified. It's a it's a strange time in this city when you have 40,000 people on the streets of downtown. But um, there was some concern that originally the communication between the police department and and residents of the city was inadequate. Uh, there was a brief period where when the police, after the first bombing and the first death, they were struggling to have any sense of motive. Uh, and I think one officer speculated about the possibility that the victim had planted the bomb himself and it had gone off accidentally or something, which to the best of our knowledge, there's no evidence for. So there were missteps, but the, from what I can gather, the the response, again, from all three levels of law enforcement was pretty intense right away. The city police were mobilized, the state troopers came in, and the FBI was on the scene very quickly. Um, I think there's more reporting to be done on this, but um, I think that except for an occasional misstep, the Austin Police Department and its chief, actually an interim chief, he's not the permanent chief, um, uh, seem to have handled most of it pretty pretty well, especially given the level of fear that was throughout the community. Um, it's always in those situations, I think, a tricky balance between letting people know about what's happening and trying to pursue an investigation. And of course, it's all unfolding in real time where lives are in danger. So um, I, I, I wouldn't, even though I'm a professor, I wouldn't necessarily offer a grade. Uh, I think the police chief has been reflective and actually pointed out some places where the response could have been better, which is positive. There's not been the kind of defensiveness on the part of this police administration that you often get when there are criticisms of law enforcement. So that's all to the good. And I think that does signal that there have been some political changes in Austin in recent elections. And it does signal that the, the white power establishment in Austin is is more willing to, to address these questions about racial disparities and wealth disparities and gentrification, um, and also to reflect on policing. Like any other large city, and Austin is the 11th largest city in the country, um, there have been over the last few years police shootings that were questionable, sometimes out and out obviously criminal. Uh, those are still, as is often the case, law enforcement does, <laughs> does not take kindly to being critically self-reflective about the use of violence, especially deadly violence. Uh, so there's still a lot of work to do on that front in Austin. Um, like many cities, the police union is very resistant to any kind of oversight, civilian monitoring. This is an unfortunate reality about police unions. They tend to block the kind of oversight that can lead to constructive change. So Austin, in my estimation, is doing better than it's done in my time here, but still has a ways to go. Mm -hmm. I just want to point out, I think the interim police chief, uh, Brian mm -hmm. Manley, uh, not right. sure whether he's going to hold on to that position or not. Uh, but uh, I would char uh, characterize, I think, use the term missteps. Words are very important. Uh, I think Mr. Manley or Chief Manley, I believe he's classified as white. I think some of the things that happened that I would point out and take uh, issue with, I think when the first bombing happened, uh, Mr. Anthony House, a uh, victim of white supremacy, and there was some speculation, well, maybe this is drug related. We're not really sure. There was a drug house uh, near here. That was something, and I think he was even self-critical uh, of how that was happened and suggestions mm -hmm. that maybe the wound or uh, maybe the uh, bombing was self-inflicted, uh, acknowledged that they could have done a better job there, in my view, and consistently with regards to white supremacy racism. I do not give individuals classified as white uh, benefit of the doubt that this was a misstep. Uh, I look at anything like that. This could have just been an act of racism, white supremacy, where that would not have been stated publicly, even if they speculated that that was the case, that would not have been said publicly if Mr. House had been a white person. That would be one. And in fact, I would even pivot uh, to a second incident when this happened. Uh, the media coverage, again, you're in the School of Journalism. Uh, I'm just reading from the Miami Herald. 
Austin ABC affiliate TV station KVUE says it has cut ties with the closed caption company it was using after one of the bombing victims there was referred to on air Tuesday night using a racial slur. The move was made Thursday, according to a statement from the station, as the reporter made reference to 17-year-old Draylon Mason, who died on March 12th when a package exploded outside his house. This monkey, in quotes, appeared on the TV screens of viewers using closed captioning. It was followed by two dashes and an apparent correction next showing this young man, which accurately reflects the reporter's words. And I'll stop there. This is another one that I just do not look if whites were involved in any way and say, oh, this was a misstep. I just look at this and say, I suspect this was a deliberate act of white supremacy racism. Do you have a response to to either one of those? Well, that I'm, I don't have any information on, um, and actually hadn't heard that story, so I don't, I don't have anything beyond what you just said on that one. The one place where um, Manley did say something that was clearly inappropriate, um, again, he's, he's apologized for it. I think the, the, the comment he made that was the most troubling was that after um, a short recording, uh, on the, I think it was on the cell phone of the bomber, um, after it was recovered, he described the bomber as a, a challenged young man, which implies that this guy had, you know, just some mental problem. He had psychological issues. He was unstable. And, and Manley said that, you know, in a, a quick press conference and later um, said he he was sorry he had said that. He was not trying to suggest there was somehow a, a rationale, a justification for these kind of acts. He was just trying to, to get at the, the fact that the recording seemed to indicate somebody who was in, extremely mentally unstable. Uh, but, you know, words matter a lot, especially in these kind of charged situations. And, and uh, you know, he was interviewed and... and he didn't retract those words in the sense that, you know, say they weren't accurate. He said he realized it was inappropriate to say that and and apologized. And, you know, I can remember when a police chief apologizing in such a manner was unthinkable. So I do think that there's, in Austin, the possibility of some progress. The mayor was very public. The mayor is also white, um, was very public during this period, um, you know, reassuring the community, that sort of thing. And he's taken some positive steps also in his administration, um, forming a, a task force. And often, you know, a task force to study institutionalized racism can be um, a diversion. Uh, I happen to know a couple people who are on it who um, felt that the work was being taken seriously. And the task force was called a, a task force on institutionalized racism, which I thought was a, a, a positive, recognizing that there is something in Austin about the structure of the way the city developed, the structure of its politics and its economic realities, the structure of the school system, the structure of housing patterns um, going back, of course, decades and centuries now, uh, that this is deeply woven into the fabric of Austin and needs that kind of response. So we'll see, you know, what goes forward. Uh, But that's the current kind of political um, climate in Austin. The other thing that's relevant in Austin is, it's almost embarrassing to say this, but up until five years ago, Austin, a city that's now a a million people, had a seven-member city council, all of whom were elected citywide. And in a city that big, when you elect members of a council citywide, it means you're giving the dominant population, of course, the ability to elect all seven members of the council. Uh, There had been agitation for years and years to go to a district system, which, of course, most big cities have, so that members of the council represent a a district in town. Uh, That's especially important in Austin, of course, because it is so segregated. Uh, so finally, five years ago, we went to what we call 10-1, a mayor elected citywide, but 10 council members elected by district. And that has, I think, by all accounts, um, been uh, an important improvement. So we have a city council now with some dynamic voices that don't back down from addressing white supremacy and the institutionalized nature of it. We have 
a young member of the city council, Greg Kassar, who represents a, a, a district in East Austin. Uh, Greg is, is Latino himself, and the district is heavily Latino. And Greg has been a kind of relentless voice for these kinds of issues. Um, there's been some movement on the school board as well, although that's more tortured in some way. Uh, the movement has been slower and more contentious, but um, the last election for the school board put three people on the school board for whom equity, that is fairness, the distribution of resources of the school district in a way that starts to take seriously the underfunding of the predominantly black and brown schools. Uh, the school board has made some progress too. So uh, the, the, the change in the city council has made it possible to shake up what had been a pretty unmovable politics in this in this town for a long, long time. And it, it's made some initial gains. Um, Greg Kassar has been at the head of those making policies for uh, improving wages, um, you know, addressing some of these issues on the police force. So yeah. that's the, the kind of background the last five, six years in Austin um, First, the movement to get that city council representation changed, and then the uh, the first elections that brought in uh, new members of that council. Context of white supremacy. I'm uh, just going by uh, KUT. That's uh, the local NPR affiliate for Austin. Mm -hmm. uh, they list the mayor, Steve Adler, uh, white man. They list his council as uh, the task force on race and systemic inequities, uh, just Gus T's opinion, white supremacy would have been a better term to use uh, as opposed to race and systemic inequities. But, you know, hey, uh, what do yeah, you make? You know, I, oh, I agree completely. And it just when you said that, I, I, I laugh because I often make a joke that as a white person, my job is when I'm talking about racial issues is to stand up and say white supremacy as many times as I can, because I think you're absolutely right. One doesn't deal with problems without understanding systems. That was articulated earlier in the show. All of the social problems that we talk about in the world don't just drift down from the heavens. They're a product of systems. And that's why I, I think it's important to use that word white supremacy as well. It's why I, why I use the word patriarchy when I'm talking about institutionalized male dominance. It's why I name capitalism as a a system in which economic equality is impossible. Uh, it's all about, to me, it's all about the systems, and I, I agree completely. But the fact is, of course, in the mainstream, um, it's still very difficult to talk about the United States as a white supremacist society. We can now in the mainstream, especially after the success of Trump, in, in, especially in liberal circles, there's a willingness to call out the white supremacy that comes from overt white supremacist groups, like, you know, the neo-Nazis or the people marching in Charlottesville or many of the openly white supremacist supporters of Donald Trump. But I think you're right. The, the next move is to recognize that it's a white supremacist society through and through. And until we can do that, I would agree there's not much hope of really, you, if you can't name the system out of which the problems comes, it's very hard to imagine meaningful solutions to problems. What do you make of the rationale for not releasing the video of the suspected bomber, uh, Mark Condit? They said uh, they didn't want to you know, glorify him and make him into some sort of martyr. You know, this is an interesting question. Friends of mine have studied this, that uh, there is pretty good evidence now that the, the worst thing the media can do when there is a mass shooting, a mass killing, this kind of act, is to name the perpetrator over and over again and to show images of the perpetrator. And I was about to say him, and of course, they're almost always men. Uh, and it does lead to a kind of glorification of the bomber, the murderer, the shooter, and of the act in some smart circles. So uh, people have suggested that the media do need to, to repress the instinct. And this is mostly a television question. Um, print media are always more restrained, but it's television that you know, is image driven, is, um, is driven by emotion uh, that is most likely to use those kind of images over and over again. And there is reason to be concerned that it does um, increase the likelihood of copycats. So, um, you know, friends of mine who study this are 
are adamant that the, the most responsible thing is not to release it. Now, at some point, the public also has a, a right to know about an investigation. And, you know, the law says that when these investigations are over, the, the material becomes public. In this case, you know, the, the perpetrator is dead, so there will be no further investigation for purposes of bringing him to court. So the question of when that should be released um, changes a bit. Um, in general, I tend to be in favor of releasing information that openness is always preferred to to secrecy. So we'll see. Uh, it might be that law enforcement has legitimate reasons for keeping it private because while the what's considered to be the main perpetrator is dead, there's still a question about accomplices. And there may be reasons, I don't have any inside information about this, but there may be reasons that they don't want to release certain kinds of information to uh, that could interfere with the investigation into potential perpetrators. They've not identified um, or charged anyone as an, um, a co-conspirator, uh, as they say, but that investigation, I'm sure, is still going on. Dr. Francis Cress Welsing, uh, the audio segment that we started with at the beginning, that was from uh, 2015. Uh, back then, uh, way before the primary, she predicted that Donald Trump would indeed uh, be the next president. And she predicted as well that there would be uh, increased direct violence uh, against black people uh, as a result of white supremacy, racism. Uh, and she compared it to the period of reconstruction uh, after the Civil War. Blacks make a lot of progress. Put in quote that word's been said a lot on this program. And you have uh, a huge white lash of violence. And she said she, she thought that a similar uh, type of violent surge would take place after President Obama, President Obama exited the White House, uh, comparing it to Nazi Germany even. Uh, what do you make of that comparison? Do you think it's accurate for what we are seeing? Well, I would be hesitant about comparisons to Nazi Germany, but the, the basic point that there's a backlash or a white lash, as you called it, um, I think is self-evident at this point. Uh, the election of Donald Trump gave space for uh, incredibly corrosive conversations about race and other forms of inequality. But as you point out, it also opens up a space for more violence. And in a sense, that's not surprising if you have a, a society like the United States that's very existence is rooted in white supremacy. Um, if that society has never fully come to terms with that history uh, and in fact still resists policies, even somewhat mild policies, take you know, something like affirmative action is still a subject of great debate. Uh, such a society uh, is demonstrated now for centuries that it is simply unwilling to reckon with that fundamental, what one might call original sin of the United States, which is the deep white supremacy that was directed against indigenous people and people of African descent, the core crimes, you could say, of US history. Well, in such a setting, when a president who is an open white supremacist, white nationalist, call him whatever you want to, uh, wins the highest office in the land, it's of course going to embolden people even further to the right than Donald Trump to engage in these kind of actions. And we've seen that. You know, this is a pretty typical pattern. Uh, it's been pointed out that the gains of the feminist movement, for instance, in the 1970s, led pretty quickly to a backlash. Um, uh, when people who take it as a right to rule, whether it's white folks or men or whatever, when that right to rule is challenged, uh, it's pretty predictable that they don't react well. And so uh, I, I think that it is, I, I must say I'm rather um, embarrassed that I, I found the election of Donald Trump to be improbable, that maybe that was just wishful thinking, I'm not sure what. But there were a lot of people who saw, it, I think, much more deeply than I did into the the current political reality and did in fact predict the election of Donald Trump. Uh, and the other prediction that follows that is playing out as well, the increase in violence. Um, 
it's a sad, sorry, one might even say pathetic reality in the United States today that we still cannot come to terms with these fundamental questions, but it still seems to be an accurate account of reality to me. Hmm. Is it is it accurate? I'm just following logic uh, with what you just said, my own assessment, what Dr. Francis Cress Welsing, her audio segment, uh, with this increased direct violence uh, in the system of white supremacy here and globally. I've been seeing a lot of these same reports uh, worldwide. Uh, is it accurate to say that people classified as white represent an increased danger to black people, non-white people? Well, the the greatest threat to the security, safety of non-white people in general, but I think especially black and indigenous America, and increasingly Latino America as well, uh, is that backlash. And that takes many forms. Uh, it takes the forms of uh, what are called you know, extrajudicial violence, that is violence that's not technically authorized by law, uh, these are, you know, militias and, and thuggish groups, um, and they're there. You know, they they've been on the margins, and they're now claiming a, a more central space in the culture. Uh, police violence has long been a problem, and it is a problem today. And while there are some police forces that are trying to deal with it during the Obama administration, there were some advances made in federal oversight of local police forces, but those are going away. And that's a, a, a very troubling problem that, you know, I don't rely on the federal government to make the world better necessarily, but under the Obama Justice Department, the use of uh, uh, the federal government, the Justice Department, to try to hold accountable local police forces and put them on corrective plans to try and, you know, reduce the, the amount of violence, that was a a good thing to do. And now we're seeing, of course, the Trump administration ignore that. So you've got violence outside the legal system. You've got violence committed by law enforcement. You've got the ongoing economic disparities, which are largely at the hands of not exclusively, but predominantly white, you know, business power structure. Uh, you've got the kind of, as we said earlier, housing segregation, um, for which there's no concerted policy to try and shift. And all of this adds up to, I think what you're pointing out is both direct violence and, and what you might call economic violence or, and a kind of psychic violence. Um, you know, I'm, I'm white and I can listen to friends and colleagues and, and others talk about the sense of anxiety, fear that comes with living, you know, as a black person in white America. Uh, I can't, experience that I, I, I do my best to understand it, but it's certainly not hard to understand all of those levels of violence and the threat they pose. Uh, you know, at this point, there has been so much writing, conversation about this, that any white person who doesn't understand, that just take parents, right? I, I have a child. If there's any white parent who doesn't understand the burden that comes with raising a black child compared to a white child in America, it's because they, they don't want to know. It's a kind of willed ignorance. The difference that a, a black kid and a white kid being raised in Austin, Texas, uh, the threats they face, uh, the fact that, you know, we, 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 even, we even describe it as the talk that black parents have with their children to warn them, to help counsel them about how to handle the possibility of police violence. Uh, that's impossible to ignore yet as you you know you're pointing out a lot of white america still does ignore it oh wait a minute hang on i, I never said that i just make sure i get that on the record i have taken yeah. a completely different position i just want to make sure that i state that oh. as emphatically as i can white people are not ignorant i have no idea how that came across because gus never oh, said well, that I, during the broadcast yeah. and hang on a second and oh, okay, sure. i never suggested at all that white people are ignoring or not paying attention to or are not aware of any of these facets in fact i have taken the completely opposite position uh, okay. no one in the universe is more informed aware conscious alert 
of the system of white supremacy than white people. And I would pretty much take any white 15 year old male, female, Australia, France, anywhere in the world where they were born. I would take their knowledge and expertise on racism at 15 over pretty much any non-white person, regardless of how many degrees, books they've read, seminars they've been to, even if they passed your class or not. That's how informed I think whites have to be to maintain the system of white supremacy. But that notwithstanding, since we have you for a limited time, what should well-meaning whites, and you put that in quotes, well-meaning whites, perhaps yourself being one, what should well-meaning whites be doing at a time like now with increased direct violence against black people, non-white people? Well, you know, there's a range of things depending on where one lives and what one has the resources to accomplish. Uh, one of the things we've been talking about is the need for white people to to speak forthrightly about it, to not, you know, kind of uh, try to to whitewash the nature of the situation. And, and, and as you keep pointing out, the, the term white supremacy is the appropriate term. And I think that white people should become more comfortable <laughs> in using that. And again, I want to point out not just to describe the overt white supremacy of neo-Nazis or Christian identity movement or skinheads or whatever it might be, but to talk about the society as a white supremacist society. And again, I try and do that across the board to talk about a patriarchal society. Systems are important. But then there's the question of, well, what, what are the actual political activities? Well, in most cities now, there are groups that have formed to try and, for instance, hold police accountable. And there are ways that white people can contribute to those movements. Uh, you know, the, the nature of white supremacy is such that almost anything you care about, uh, let's say you're a white environmentalist, well, it's kind of hard to to do environmental politics today without recognizing there's a disparate, disparate effect of pollution, of environmental degradation on low income, which of course are then proportionally, disproportionately black and brown communities, the siting of toxic waste dumps. I mean, we, we have now an, a term for this, the environmental justice movement that's mm -hmm. been making you know, these critiques for the better part of three or four decades now. So whatever issue is most compelling to someone, there is a racial angle to it that should be pursued. Uh, you know, in, in, Teaching, of course, if you're teaching about social, economic, cultural issues, there's no way to be a responsible teacher, whether it's the kindergarten level or the college level, without incorporating uh, an understanding of all these systems in the, the way that people's life expectancies go. How are you going to, to likely live in this world as a function of things like white supremacy and patriarchy. Let me give you just an example. I had a guest speaker, a wonderful guest speaker in Austin over the past few days, uh, culminating this weekend. Uh, and her name is Carolyn West. She's a professor of psychology at the University of Washington, Tacoma, uh, a leading expert on domestic violence and sexual assault, especially the racialized dimensions of it. Carolyn's African-American herself. Uh, and has developed a lot of important training materials uh, over the years in her work on that. She's now studying the contemporary pornography industry, which is a relentlessly misogynistic, sexist industry, but also a relentlessly racist industry. And for four days, Carolyn was in town speaking at various agencies and universities uh, about the racialized misogyny in pornography. So there's an issue about the sexual exploitation of women in which we foregrounded the racialized dimension, it opens up people's understanding of the way society works in certain ways. So, uh, uh, you know, people are positioned in different places with different resources. Uh, and whatever one is trying to do in the world to make the world a better place, it seems to me that incorporating a critique of white supremacy, incorporating a critique of patriarchy, incorporating a critique of capitalism, is essential if you want to actually advance anything that we could call, you know, progressive uh, or just better, perhaps better stated, just 
a decent human community. Uh, there's little hope without these kind of foundational critiques of systems. Context of white supremacy. Uh, the number again, 641-715-3640. The code 564-943-9400. Pound. Press star six one if you have a question. Uh, folks, remember, we do not have Dr. Jensen for the whole program. He'll just be with us uh, for about 10 minutes. So if you have a question, do not lollygag. Don't wait till the last minute. Go ahead. Get your hand up now. Get your question in star six one for the folks that are on the line listening. Uh, also wanted to know uh, the film i don't know if you've uh, seen it or not it's a film we talked about quite a bit on the program uh, you study media and journalism uh the purge film series are you familiar yes no you know what i'm talking about i i know i know i know what you're talking about i know the plot i haven't seen okay. the films okay that's no problem there you probably saved some time and energy <laughs> good job uh, Are you recommending them? That's no, 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 no. Not at all. Okay. Not at all. Got it. Just, Got it. Okay. just pointing them out for academic purposes because there is okay. uh, a fourth film uh, coming out and connecting with everything that we've talked about with the bombings, which uh, may or may not, time will tell, be connected to racism, white supremacy more directly uh, and everything else. Uh, these films uh, have, uh, for folks who haven't seen the plot of these films, it's basically there's one day a year where all yeah. crimes are illegal, so you can kill people, rape people, whatever you want to do, no punishment at all. Uh, but the racial white supremacy aspect of the films is pretty explicit. The first film is basically uh, a gang of whites, young, very young whites, like 20-year-old whites, hunting a black male to kill him. And uh, there's a line, your, one of your colleagues at the University of Texas, Austin, he points points out there's a scene in the film which made millions of dollars uh, where they have a black male bound, tied to a chair. He's been shot by a white man. They, he's been tortured by whites. And a white man stands over him and says, get a rope. Dr. Kevorkian pointed that line out, chilling in the history of white supremacy. But I'm pointing out the film because there's a fourth film about to uh, come out. The third one came out right during the election. It was called Purge Election Year, and it was kind of uh, dramatizing a Trump-like figure uh, being in charge. And the fourth film, they have uh, paraphernalia that has a red hat that is very similar to the iconic Make America Great type of hats. Just can you comment on how having this type of media can fuel that direct white violence that we were talking about? Yeah, so I haven't seen the films and I don't know if any of this violence is presented with a critique or if it's celebrated. Uh, but sometimes that doesn't matter. What, what research has shown that the intention of the filmmaker is not always that relevant to how people interpret a film. So what I mean by that is, let's say you have uh, racist violence, white racists torturing a black man, but in the end somehow the white racists get their due, you know, they're somehow punished. Now, it might be the intention of the filmmaker, or at least the stated intention of the filmmaker, to say, I'm trying to, you know, tell a moral story here where if you engage in this kind of violence, you will be punished. But that doesn't mean that the audience is reading the film, interpreting the film the same way. And it's quite possible, and in fact almost likely, I think, that some of the people watching the film don't get the subtle moral message and they simply revel in the violence, the racialized violence against a black man. Uh, so I'm always very skeptical of, of films that use this kind of violence especially allegedly in the service of teaching a lesson, of having a moral to the story. Um, we're a nation, of course, awash in violence of many, many different kinds. And it's naive, I think, to think that you can simply, you know, use violence to constructive ends in movies, especially when people go to movies, you know, typically not to, to engage in moral discourse, but for entertainment. And in a culture that's conditioned to see violence as entertainment. Uh, the movies sound quite chilling, actually. Um, um, I might have to go read up on these things. Uh, you know, there's so much pop culture, uh, a lot of it just washes past me because I simply can't figure out how to 
navigate it all. Um, and I'm getting old, so you know, going to the movies isn't what it used to be. Uh, but it is, it's disturbing, um, even in the context of a potential critique. Those images are powerful. Um, and that's maybe a, a movie I won't put on my must-see list. Who knows? Uh, do not feel bad for avoiding it. Speaking to both Dr. <laughs> Jensen and listeners, do not yeah. feel bad. You don't need it to add. You don't need to add it to your Netflix queue. I do think it's important to be aware of the danger of these type of films. I don't think there is a critique of white supremacy, racism, or anti-black violence at all. I think it is just re and not just reveling, making millions of dollars. I think I used the hashtag recently within the last seven days, killing black people pays in the system of white supremacy. Exhibit A, the PERD, I think they've made over $100 million with very cheaply, poorly constructed films that are basically all centered around violence directed at black people lethal white violence directed at black people uh if well that's interesting because it dovetails exactly with the analysis of carolyn west the speaker i just was mentioning who came came through central texas to lecture about the racism in pornography so there's a, a critique of pornography that we don't have time to get into but it's interesting that the racism in pornography is not subtle it's right out front old style uh, the, the most grotesque racist stereotypes, not just of African Americans, but of all non-white racial groups. And again, millions of dollars every year made. Billions, uh, billions, come on now, billions. And, and uh, this, this racist misogyny, in other words, um, the sexual domination of women made more intense through racist ideology. Uh, it's right there on the surface. We're not talking about, you know, having to do some subtle interpretation. It's, it's so blunt and so ugly that it's self-evident. And yet there's very little commentary about it. Um, and, and Carolyn's presentation was so powerful in part because it reminds us of how often, as you're pointing out, in pop culture, and pornography is kind of on the edge of pop culture, but it's an increasingly, you know, mainstream form of sexual entertainment for literally virtually, you know, all men in the culture at this point, at least for young men. Uh, why is that not discussed? Why is the, the violence in movies that you're talking about that's racialized not discussed? That's an interesting question uh, that perhaps answers itself in a white supremacist society. When there's money to be made on this, there's going to be limited critique of it, perhaps. So, um, another mm. disturbing aspect of the culture we live in context of white supremacy i think uh you were supposed to be here to talk to us about carolyn west because she is at the university of washington tacoma i am in seattle washington so oh, well, i guess i was supposed to try to track her down and see if we can get her on the program because her work sounds fabulous uh we did have a caller though uh emmy did Go you ahead. have a question for dr jensen you should be with us can i be heard yes ma'am Greetings, and uh, thank you for coming on the broadcast. You know, I've been listening to the conversation, and um, the very same scientist that made the prediction about Trump is also stating that the United States is moving towards a similar white supremacy expression as Nazi Germany. And when you responded, you mentioned, you said, well, you don't think that you could you know, make that correlation, is it possible that she could be practicing racism by not actually paying that much attention to it? To talk about increased direct violence against black people and everything that she said would confirm that we are in fact moving in that direction, but you didn't just want to say it. If there are, if there is increased direct violence, if a person like Donald Trump could become the president, and all of these other things that you mentioned, why is there any reluctance as to calling it what it is, that we are, in fact, moving in that direction? Thank you. Uh, well, that's a, a provocative question, and, and it's going to be, have to be my last response because uh, I'm going to have to get off the call. But uh, I think I'm, I'm hesitant. The word fascism is an interesting word in political discourse because uh, it's a term that's used, I think, often without much clarity. So 
You know, fascism is a term typically used to describe very specific regimes in mid-20th century Europe, most notably the, the German and, and Italian varieties. And it has certain characteristics. Other kinds of systems can be violent. Other kinds of systems can be oppressive. Other su- kinds of systems can be racialized. So to me, the reason I hesitate to use the comparison to Nazi Germany is because the scale of that violence in Nazi Germany, of course, was quite different. Um, you're talking about concentration camps and mass murder on a, a dramatically different scale. Uh, my point would be that the system we live in, which is a kind of you know, capitalist democracy, can also be violent, can also be based and is based on historic patterns of inequality like white supremacy, like patriarchy, and that that system should be critiqued and examined, but it is a different kind of system. In the same way that, you know, the Soviet, the totalitarian system of the Soviet Union wasn't fascism. It was described in different ways. So uh, to me, it's not a a concern about a, a severe, harsh critique. It's about trying to name political systems accurately. And in that sense, I don't think we live in a fascist country. And I'm not sure we're heading toward the kind of fascism if by that we mean the style of Nazi Germany. We might be heading toward a different intensification of a racialized society. Uh, And it might be that it will take on a similar tone to Nazi Germany. I, of course, hope not. But it might develop in different ways, in which case we'll describe it in different ways. So um, I guess that's, for me, not a question of naming the severity of white supremacist violence. It's a question of trying to understand the political system in which it operates. Context of white supremacy. Uh, Again, our guest, Dr. Robert Jensen, uh, author of The Heart of Whiteness, Confronting Race, Racism, and White Privilege. White supremacy, not in that title either. Uh, Thank you so much for hanging out with us this evening. Real pleasure to have you back on the program. I'm sure we will, uh, or at least we will look forward to the chance to speak with you again, Dr. Jensen. Thank you very much. Great to be with you. For sure. Evening. Context of white supremacy. I did see other folks with a hand up, uh, but I'd said uh, consistently, I think, from the very beginning that Dr. Jensen had said he could only hang out with us uh, for an hour. So I told folks, you know, go ahead, get a hand up early. Uh, If you have a question, I think I said consistently, don't wait till the last minute. And that's something that I would say pretty much anytime there is uh, a form discussion, particularly if you have an opportunity uh, to question a suspected race soldier, man, you should enthusiastically have your hand up, like with an abundance of black self-respect, like in the spirit of our grandsister, Dr. Francis Cress Welsing. I'm going to get my hand up and use my brain computer to the best of my ability to ask at least one good question, if not five. <laughs> like, uh, really, like you should be excited uh, with the chance to get better uh, at asking questions. Uh, that's something I definitely encourage uh, and expect uh, from Cal's listeners. Be looking forward to the chance to uh, question racist man, racist woman, racist child. Uh, The word fair did creep into the broadcast. Uh, I have to remind folks, the term uh, conflation, Dr. Saeed, uh, one of our listeners in the UK, nine years of the cows. Dr. Jensen, you can go back in the archives, March of 2009, nine years ago in the month of March, Dr. Jensen was on this broadcast and I almost made audio clips of some of the times because there have been like legendary moments on the cows uh, with Dr. Jensen, like put legendary in context too, because, you know, it didn't end racism. So couldn't have been that monumental, but uh, where Dr. Jensen was here, one of them was in March, 2009, where he uh, admitted his annoyance with the phrase victim of white supremacy. You can go back and get that one on the archives. Uh, Also, you can check out a much longer exchange to appreciate the magnitude of the moment, but definitions reminded me so much of Cheryl Moses uh, for people who heard the exchange a couple days back 
uh, Come Meet a Black Person, Victim of White Supremacy, Cheryl Moses, when we were talking about definitions of racism. Dr. Jensen, when he was on the program the third time, I think his, the, the last time he was on the program in the spring of 2011, <laughs> seven years ago, he was on the program. We talked about the definition of racism, white supremacy. He said he didn't agree with the part about the term dedicated, which was interesting because we had already discussed my definition the first time he visited in March of 2009. So the third time he visits, uh, he squabbles about the word uh, dedicated. Okay, so we go back and forth. It doesn't get as bad as the exchange with Cheryl Moses. He didn't leave the program, but, you know, we, we did not agree. No problem. We proceed with the broadcast now. He didn't agree that whites were dedicated collectively to white supremacy racism. About 20 minutes later in the program, he's talking about white collective commitment. This is one of the best hot moment, uh, hot mic moments in the nine year history of the cows. Generally, I mute my line. People that, that know, uh, that have listened, I generally mute my line just in case I'm in a noisy environment. I have not always had the benefit of being in a super quiet environment like I am right now. So I generally use my mute button. Plus, sometimes I am not a quiet listener. Uh, I am, you know, giggling at responses or cursing at people or calling folks names, whatever the case might be. Uh, or I might have to sneeze, whatever. I mute my line. Sometimes uh, I forget. And, you know, I think I'm muted because I'm accustomed to being muted where I can giggle and name call people and whatever I want. And I'm muted this time. I was not muted and I thought I was. And Dr. Jensen said, commitment. And I said, I like, oh, ooh, like we did all that back and forth and wasted all that time uh, for you to say, well, I don't know about dedicated. Like why? And I mean, you've heard that from lots of whites when we've done the definition on the program to then come back, not even 30 minutes. It was like, it was real early, relatively speaking in the broadcast to come back and, oh man. And he immediately, he knew it. He didn't say the word commitment. The rest of the pride almost made a sound clip, but it would have taken so long. It would have distracted from the importance of the subject matter that we're talking about today, which is the Austin bombings, uh, which I think is hugely important. I think with what Dr. Francis Cress Welsing said, what we've been talking about on the program years before, again, lashes, she coined the phrase, I think, uh, 21st century post reconstruction uh, period of violence uh, that we're in right now, increased direct white violence. I'm not saying race war because racism, white supremacy is war. You just have periods where you have increased direct white violence. You can call it terrorism, but just more of it, more than what you would typically have in the system of white supremacy. At any rate, uh, conflation, make sure I explain. We talked about that and in connection with Robert Jensen, every time he's been on the cows, conflation, the concept of people will talk about racism, white supremacy, but they will include classism, feminism, ageism, patriarchy, LGBTQIA, whichever other letters they have added, they will add in all of these other things to make it seem like you just have what they'll call systems of oppression, injustices. They'll try to make it a little bit more nebulous than you have the system of white supremacy and that dominates everything. Everything else is like a way distant, you know, tenth. Uh, it is the system of white supremacy. And if you're classified as white, if you're LGBTQIA, whatever other initials, if you're disabled, if you're elderly, uh, if you whatever illness you might have, you being classified as white, that is supposed to trump everything. Trump everything. Absolutely. Uh, and they understand that you cannot be. And that was an important uh, exchange on this one as well, because, sir, if any of the listeners at any point heard Gus suggest or in any way state anything that could be interpreted as whites are ignorant or not paying attention to or not aware of white supremacy, racism, Please let me know and I will flog myself and make sure to never do that again. But I'm real certain I did not say anything 
uh, even leading in that direction uh, when he made that comment and just included as though we are in agreement, he and I, that some whites might be pretending to be ignorant. And I do not agree with that at all. You have some whites who from time to time lie, which is totally different than pretend. You have a lot of lying about what they understand, what they know about racism, white supremacy when they talk to non-white people. But that is very different from them being ignorant or not aware or even pretending. Correct words. Very, very important. Uh, and I also I just want to read the uh, the email. That was one question I did forget to uh, to ask, even though I am going to inquire about Carolyn West, uh, her work. Uh, that I would be very interested to hear her work about white supremacy uh, and the porn industry uh, and what she's uncovered. I will check that out, see if it's constructive, see if we can get her on the broadcast. Oh, she has a website. If you all want to do your own research, it is www.drcarolynwest.com. Carolyn with a C, C-A-R-O-L-Y-N, uh, drcarolynwest.com, D-R. Uh, you can check it out if you are so inclined. Um, yeah, uh, my apologies to the folks who did not get an opportunity to get a question in. Uh, wish we uh, could have got your hand in earlier, uh, but very important subject matter, uh, in my opinion, with the situation in Austin. As I said, Dr. Welsing, she predicted that she would have this sort of violence. Uh, I did not see very much coverage of this event. That's one thing I wish I had asked uh, Dr. Uh, Jensen, I think I might have said Dr. Kevorkian. That's one thing I wish I had asked Dr. Jensen uh, about the media coverage. I just don't think that this the the Austin bombings got very much coverage. Uh, it's my impression. I think I asked some of the listeners about this a few weeks back. It's my impression that there's more coverage about the Parkland shooting situation or the tariff uh, situation or what's you know going to happen with the Trump probe, like that's my sense that this is not really big news. Like maybe, you know, it got talked about a little bit last week when the suspected bomber race soldier, uh, when they said, you know, he killed himself, but it seems like that has been quickly forgotten, moved on, you know, other things to, to talk about and deliberate on, uh, what's, you know, are we going to have the gun march this weekend and marching for our lives? Like that, you know, total focus, uh, on that and not the, the bombing situation, which I think Dr. Welsing would also, uh, really have a lot to say about. I think is it just extraordinarily dangerous that the only fatalities in this situation, black males. Uh, and I think the first three victims were all non white people, uh, extraordinarily dangerous, something that people should be paying attention to. And in context, it's not like this is an, a lone, isolated incident. Uh, I would hope folks are paying attention, especially if you're in the Texas area, but really uh, anywhere in the world and just taking it serious and uh, having that reflected in our behavior, how we function. Uh, with that, I will get the callers that we missed uh, who didn't get a chance to get their question in. If you want to share what your question was going to be or if you just have a thought uh, about what you uh, heard transpire. Uh, think retired firefighter. Did you have a uh, question, comment? Sorry, we didn't didn't have time to get your your commentary in when Dr. Jensen was was, was with us. <clears throat> Greetings, everyone. Can I be heard? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, I, I was, uh, kind of like multitasking and, uh, I didn't want to get caught doing the, uh, other activity that I was involved, uh, involved in. Uh, but, uh, I, uh, as I was listening to the program, um, uh, and, uh, the subject came up about making, uh, from uh, making killers uh, popular. Well, I, I have been say, I have been stating lately over the past year, you know, when I do watch television, uh, that because that's not that's not really new. Uh, uh, for instance, Adolf Hitler uh, has been dead now, reportedly since 1945, and I guarantee you if you wanted to see something on him any day of the week 365 days of the year 
you can find something on Adolf Hitler. Uh, uh, speaking of Texas, uh, the Whitman uh, sniper uh, who uh, did the shooting uh, at the University of Texas back in, I believe, 1965. You know, these, these people have been like celebrities. Uh, they Lee Harvey Oswald. Pardon? I'm sorry for interrupting. I was just going to, they made a movie about the, uh, the sniper at the university of Texas. They made a movie about that. Yeah. Yeah. So a, 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 a real nice documentary. As a matter of fact, it, 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 they, somebody, somebody actually, uh, did some, uh, imagine, imaginative, uh, 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 filming by making it out of like a cartoon, like, uh, uh, viewing uh of of the incident that he was involved in and actually it was it, it motivated uh something that uh it, it motivated the police to form all across uh this part of the world SWAT teams which we know impacted us especially the black panther party uh but i, I can i can give you a list bonnie and clyde uh, uh john dillinger you know the only reason why i know these people is because you can see them almost every day of the week on television. And all, all these people have been dead for, for quite a while. So it's nothing new. It's nothing new about uh, uh, what white people are doing. Speaking about the school shootings, I wasn't, wasn't going to ask him any question about that, but, but speaking on this level about uh, white people and violence, even, with, even on, on, on themselves, this whole thing about school shooting, I, I, I think I wrote to you about it. Uh, this thing, this has been going on for, for decades with white people. <laughs> you know, they, they've been killing each other in the schoolhouses massively. Uh, you know, uh, I, I saw this documentary that lasted six hours, a six hour documentary on school shootings, uh, that, that went back to 1927. I wouldn't be surprised if it went back even further than that. But they started from 1927 up until present, and uh, it's six hours long of, uh, of of mass killings in schools. So it's nothing new. It's nothing new at all, you know, as far as that concerned. Uh, yeah, those those are some of the things that that are related to, uh, I believe, what the discussion was uh, this evening. Uh, but. Uh, that's all I have to say for right now. Thank you. Appreciate that. Retired firefighter in Florida. Um, yeah, the the uh, the commentary about the monkey I thought was important as well, where the news outlet, where the closed captioning referred to uh, one of the victims of the bombings as a monkey. Uh, I thought that was hugely uh, important as well. Not an accident in the system of white supremacy. Uh, Emmy, if you're with us, did you have uh, any thoughts about what you heard about Dr. Jensen, uh, specifically about uh, his unwillingness uh, to agree with Dr. Welsing's comparison to the time period we're in right now being uh, identical to what was happening in Nazi Germany? Oh, you're there, Emmy? Maybe she's not able to chat. She might need a a moment. Anywho, while we take a second, if she uh, wants to chime in or is able to chime in, she can let us know. Uh, the number again, 641-715-3640 and the code 564-943-POUND. Press star 61 uh, if you have a question, comment on what you heard from uh, Dr. Robert Jensen. Uh, also, I uh, wanted to make sure I got in. I just I mentioned the purge. I had that as one of the, the final questions, even though I did. I wish I had asked him about the coverage of, of the bombings next time. Uh, but the purge films, I just saw that that fourth film is coming out. I wasn't even aware that they were doing uh, a fourth film. And this is supposed to be like how all of this started. I'm not saying that people need to go watch the film uh, or that we're doing uh, an analysis. I think we covered all of the films before that was in part of the analysis as to uh, why I thought Trump was going to win. But I think Dr. Welsing consistently, when she talked about 
Nazi Germany, she would mention specifically Joseph Goebbels. That would be one person specifically. And she would talk about the significance, the importance of images. And she would talk about all of the degrading images of black people. She would talk about films uh, like Precious. She would talk about films uh, like Tyler Perry movies uh, that, you know, disparaging and making fun of black grandmothers and all of the hard work and black self-respect that they have invested uh, in black people for centuries. Uh, but she would talk about that. And she would talk about how those films uh, in Nazi Germany that allowed, that motivated, that set the conditions to help aid what Adolf Hitler wanted to do, killing these individuals because he said they were not white. She talked about that consistently. Uh, and if you look at the content, I would even say you can include a film like Get Out in that uh, to think that, you know, this film, all of that promotion and she was talking about, that was a big aspect of it. Miscegenation, as they called it. You can insert cowbell. But uh, she talked about that consistently, seeing these types of images. You could take that and then you put that with The Purge uh, and some of this other content, which is consistently violence against black people and i mean the purge it's all lethal violence let's kill him get a rope let's shoot him let's torture him let's you know time up and stab him and you know rape this black female and i mean just the most grotesque imaginative violence uh that you can you know possibly display like that's what these films celebrate and make millions of dollars all around the world i know dr welsing would be saying look at a film like that and then you take this bombing situation like that is not an accident. That is predictable in the system of white supremacy, particularly in this environment with the person currently occupying the White House, the person who just left the White It is predictable uh, to have that sort of it's fomenting. It is encouraging this sort of behavior. And it would behoove us to be aware uh, of the danger. That was why I asked him that question. Uh, do whites represent an increased day? Not that they weren't dangerous before, but an increased danger in this particular environment in the system of white supremacy. And folks can, you know, let me know if I'm not making sense if it sounds confusing if i'm not being logical uh feel free to let me know uh other folks uh have any comments they want to get in what they heard about uh dr jensen uh if you have any uh, comments on the bombing situation certainly the media coverage that is definitely one thing uh any of the folks that are listening in uh just your assessment of this being covered i felt like i had to work hard to get additional details especially after this was no longer like the story after I think uh, last Tuesday, I believe, uh, when the bombing, the suspected race soldier, when they reported that he allegedly had self uh, terminated, uh, it was like you had to search out, uh, at least for me. I felt like I had to search to get information about this uh, as opposed to other very trivial things. Like when I go to the front page, I'll keep the page up with uh, Dr. Carolyn West's information so that I'll remember to contact her but like when i go to the new york times or the washington post like this is not you know one of the top stories to update you know what's going on are they going to release the video and what's up with some of the other uh victims like yeah they're talking about you know trump trump they're not talking about this at all uh martin luther king uh sanctuaries veterans i mean they're not talking about this at all uh they're talking about everything uh but this uh which you know i just i cannot imagine if someone had done that if some of the victims if the first, the only fatalities had been uh lgbt lgbtia whichever other letters if that had been the case uh if they had been classified as quote unquote jews uh, if they had been white period i cannot imagine uh this just being something that eh, you know Moving on, other things to talk about, you know, springtime and, you know, what did that wacky Trump say today? What what did he tweet today? I cannot imagine that under any circumstances. Uh, even that, mar the timing of that, like, this event, and then it immediately went to the march over the week, the march for our lives, where you just had people being bombed to death, uh, and te black people bombed to death in Texas, and we moved on, other things to talk about. Uh, I definitely, if folks have uh, thoughts or analysis, because we do have people that are in different parts of the world. So if you have thoughts about the uh, media coverage 
uh, or lack thereof this, I would be interested. Uh, and certainly, if Emmy, if you have any any comments that you want to get in about Dr. Jensen, your question, uh, how he responded before we wrap up, that would be grand as well. Uh, any other folks have commentary? Uh, can I go at it again if no one else speaks up? Uh, well, the caller at 3637, uh, we'll get them and then we can come back. Uh, 3637. Hi. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for letting me say something. I, I wanted to say about the coverage, and I just turned, I just tuned in, so I missed the uh, doctor. But the coverage that I took note of was the images of the victims they had. I don't know if somebody might have already addressed this, but uh, I went to CNN when it first happened. I went to CNN online. And they had an image of the man that he was a victim, but the image they chose, I mean, they didn't go and get his college graduation picture or his high school picture or maybe a football picture. It just, he looked like he could, they could have tried to pin the bombing on him, the way they had the picture up there. And then if I remember the young man, I could be wrong, but I think they went and got a picture of him again. They didn't go and get his graduation picture. They didn't go and get his, I don't know, some, his senior picture. They got a picture of him with a, a 12, a gauge, a gun or something. I mean, I could be wrong, but I was paying attention to the imagery because when I seen the, the first victim and I was reading, they didn't have images up at first, but then... Uh, well, maybe a day or two went by, they put an image up of the victim, and the image they chose, it just, I don't know. It, I was confused at first. I was like, well, is this the person that was doing the bombing? And then I read it, and then he was a picture. I don't know. That was a confusing uh, imagery of the victims. That's what I noted from it. And, and also, they're not talking about it. I agree with you 100%, Gus. Um, it is not getting talked about. They went straight to what Trump did. Okay, I'll mute my line. Hmm, appreciate that. I did not see the images. I think the image that I've seen of uh, Mr. Mason, he was 17. I'm just Mr. Mason. The image that I've seen of him, I think most frequently, is him with a a uh, violin. I'm a little ignorant, so it might not be a violin. It's a string instrument. How about that? That's the image that I think I've seen most consistently, but uh, I would have to go back and uh, investigate that. That sounds consistent. I think I've I've heard that report repeatedly when black people have been victims, fatalities of white terrorist violence, uh, where they, you know, get these strange photographs they don't get a photo they don't get a photograph of you know a black person with a microscope being a scholar you know showing exuding black self-respect uh they don't go get that type of picture uh let's see check check and see if we had any other folks who comments uh retired firefighter do you want to go ahead and get your commentary in yes i i, I agree with the uh the lack of report on the uh the killer and even even when it gets down to details, like you know, where did where did this guy get his training from? I mean, to get a firearm and use it, it doesn't take an expert to be successful at killing people. But when you're talking about explosives and timing explosives, it, there has to be some sort of training involved. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there were some assistance in that in that uh, uh, training process, let alone talking about now some of the, some of the some of the ingredients to make that equipment that he had, you probably can get from you know an, an average hardware store, but you know I, I I think he had some dynamite somewhere, and you just can't walk in somewhere and get that, you know, and so it's a lot of stuff that was not really reported in detail in detail uh along with it you know that uh you know about about uh, the story uh i mean just about every time i hear uh that sort of of uh equipment used in a, a terrorist act automatically i look I, I look towards in this part of the world especially more so than anywhere a white person is, is involved directly or indirectly 
And uh, that was a thought that I, I haven't heard anything on that yet uh, of detail. And that's what I wanted to include. That's a great point because, again, this uh, race soldier, he was 23. I mean, you know, <laughs> I don't know how many uh, shop classes or high school, you know, vocational classes offer that sort of expertise or even community colleges uh, to be 23 and that dangerous. That's what I mean. Like whites, uh, <laughs> very important segment where he was kind of segueing into that whites are ignorant and that sort of thing. 23 years old, expert racism, white supremacy. That's what it suggests to me. And I, I wish they would go ahead and release the video. I'm all for open information. Let's see what he said uh, on the video. We can make our own determination uh, about motivation. Uh, the caller at 2812. Uh, 2812. If you had commentary, you should be with us. Can I be heard, guys? Yes, sir. Greetings. Uh, greetings. Uh, 2812 from VA. Um, <clears throat> yeah, in reference to the bomber, um, I helped out with another broadcast on an FM station here, and we had a young lady that was doing some uh, work in that um, Texas area, and she even stated on our broadcast that at one point in time, and I'm, I think other people have already heard about this, was that they actually mistook uh, one of the black people actually being a perpetrator. Um, sorry about that. Being a perpetrator, I'll have to get back. Um, I'm sorry, I got a dog working in the background. I'll interrupt everybody. My apologies. Man's best friend. Man's best friend. <laughs> um, other folks, context of white supremacy. If other folks have commentary, number again, 641-715-3640 and the code 564-943-POUND. Press star 61 if you have commentary, uh, again, we'll be here tomorrow for Workplace Racism, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. And we'll be here on Friday. Angie Thomas, The Hate You Give, uh, book session number four uh, this Friday. Looking forward to continuing a book that is chock full of anti-blackness. <laughs> uh, the color... Let's see. I guess you're on the free HD line. Uh, call on the free HD line. If you had commentary, you should be with us. Hey, how you doing, Gus? Um, right poorly. Hi. Can, you, can I be heard? Yes, sir. Yes. Um, my name is Javon. I'm out of Atlanta. Um, one thing I noticed about the, um, the Austin um, bombing the terrorists that was going around bombing people in Austin was that the media was very reluctant not to call him a terrorist. And um, I um, had a conversation with um, some other victims of white supremacy about what to do in a situation like this when something like this happens in your, your, your neighborhood. And he suggested that instead of depending on the suspected race holders to um, basically protect you from any type of terrorism happening to you. Um, victims of white supremacy should uh, get together and form, you know, protective groups and, and uh, monitor their neighborhoods. You know. I think it was a report that during the Austin bombing that um, the police in the area was telling victims of white supremacy stay in, 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 in five. And um, he suggested to do the total opposite. And I was just um, wondering what you would think think about that suggestion. Uh, there's a, a long history of black people uh, doing what you're talking about, organizing groups uh, to provide some semblance of security uh, or at least to just patrol, monitor the area where black people reside. Uh, we will shoot back uh, one of better one of the best books that I've read on racism, white supremacy. We had the author on the program talks about that history uh, in miss it or just in the South uh, period. Uh, but there's a long history of that that is very constructive. I think a uh, great exercise in black self-respect uh, to just go around and, and patrol. I think still being very cognizant. Now, we are in a system of racism, white supremacy. There also is a long history of uh, racists sabotaging those types of efforts or retaliating 
uh, to discourage those types of efforts. But, you know, you understand that, you know, that's to be expected that it's a part of white supremacy racism. But, yeah, I think that's uh, constructive investment of time and energy and makes sense uh, for this time period. Uh, and, and in addition to the patrolling, uh, some of that time could be spent uh, codifying, studying the system of racism, white supremacy, which will probably enhance the efficiency of the patrols. Um, I just didn't know. I didn't. I didn't have a concrete either or. Um, I know I read uh, uh, Millie Fuller's compensatory. Um, his um his his work. I read his work, and I think it was a chapter about um maximum um compensatory. I I, I, I can't recall exactly, but I I think to the notion he said something about. The victim would have to decide if they had enough in order to, you know, it's up to the victim to decide if they're tired of being victimized, you know, to make that decision and go all the way out with it. I mean, I'm, not, I'm pretty sure I'm not quoting him, you know, directly, but to some form of what I'm saying. And um, I don't really... Um, but on the other hand, I feel like what my um, friend of mine was saying was very constructive, too. I think it, it was going to be constructive, but to actually go out there and patrol, and I don't know how constructive that is, per se, but I, I, take, I take it in, um, I take in all information and suggestions on how to keep things like this from happening. So it's going to happen again. You know, it's, it's just a matter of time, and... It's up to, I feel like it's up to, to us as victims to be able to, you know, keep, keep things like this from, you know, impacting us on such a major level. And um, I'll mute my line and see you listen. Mm, absolutely. Well, there's there absolutely nothing that can be done under these circumstances to stop it from happening unless I've been misinformed. I think there are a lot of uh, examples where black people were patrolling and whites came in and did whatever they wanted to do. Uh, anyway, I'm thinking a specific example right now, the what they call the Atlanta child murders, which is not accurate. Uh, they had black people uh, patrolling after a number of black children had continued to disappear and be killed. And they got a lot of publicity. You know, you had black people going around with weapons and saying, you know, we're going to defend black children. And then, you know, within a matter of a short period, uh, a child ended up right in the area where they had been patrolling. So that is the system of racism, white supremacy. Uh, it's up to the individual to evaluate. I would just say with Mr. Fuller, I think what you're talking about is maximum emergency compensatory act a maximum emergency compensatory act it used to be uh, McJ uh, but that is something entirely different from just uh, patrolling uh, that is about counter violence as you said up to the victim non-white person to decide when they uh, cannot take anymore and they're going to engage in counter violence but that's very different from uh, patrolling uh, and just you know saying you want to walk around and, and monitor or provide surveillance uh, for your area uh, what have you. Uh, other folks, uh, you had commentary uh, that you wanted to get in? Uh, let's see. Uh, Emmy, did you have... Can I be heard? Yes, ma'am. Um, in response to his response to my question, I felt that he could be practicing racism. I think that although having a term that accurately describes something, we already have that term. So I thought we were all on the same page, that no matter if it's called fascism or whatever other terms he wanted to use, that what really speaks to the reality is the system of white supremacy. So I wasn't impressed or anything by his response other than it confirmed for me that I think he could be practicing racism. And in being so wordy, it took away from what I was trying to get at, which is that Dr. Wilson, who is a scientist, and I maintain that the point of science is to be able to make predictions. That's one of the points that you study something so much that you're able to predict what is going to occur. 
And Dr. Weldon did that with precision when so many other people could not and did not. Therefore, if and since she was able to do that, then it would only be correct to assume that her analysis, whether, you know, calling it fascism or whatever, is correct. And I know that we have a tendency, and perhaps maybe not here on the cows, but maybe there might be some newer cows listener who may not, you know, have the um, codification and have listened to a bunch of white people could come across that podcast and hear him denounce her prediction pretty much and say, well, I wouldn't call it Nazism. Um, this important. Anyway, that was the reason why I posed the question that I did. Throughout the conversation, I felt that he did that often, um, would be extremely wordy, and that for me, it completely diminished the severity of the problem, and it lessened the sense of urgency that any supposedly well-meaning white person should be instilling, promoting for non-white black people, whether they have the solution to what we should do in a situation that we find ourselves in or not, but to make sure that we understand what's going on. And the increase uh, in direct violence, you know, this is exactly how it began. Nazi Germany wasn't just born literally overnight. You know, Hitler was elected. So policies are put in place that led up to that. So just to say that we're not there right now was completely idiotic to say that to people. And I felt that he, as a professor, should and does know that. So I suspect he was practicing racism. No system, even if it's going to create a new manifestation of itself, does it just boom like that. It doesn't happen that way. And so what we're seeing are the increments of its increase or its change. Or That's how I view it. And so coming on here, that was the entire point, I thought. Um, and so that's pretty much all I'm trying to say. Thank you all for listening. Appreciate that, Emmy. Uh, the male caller who spoke up simultaneously. Thank you so much for your patience. Uh, did you want to proceed with your commentary? Yeah, this is all. <clears throat> 2812. My apologies to Gus and all the listeners for my little uh, um, interruption on my bad. Uh, what I was just stating earlier was that um, I did another broadcast um, and there was a young lady that was doing some work in the Texas area, and she stated that on the local news networks, um, and I'm, I think it was national, but one of the black people that was actually killed by one of the bombers was actually named on one of their news broadcasts as being a suspect. And she had stated that it took the news broadcast that made this assumption days to even issue an apology and the apology was sort of your typical of uh, we made a error statement kind of thing, my bad, and the family was extremely upset. And I can't remember exactly uh, which, which victim that it was, but um, that was something that occurred. Uh, in reference to Mr. Jensen, um, I definitely agree with him. I mean, he was practicing racism. Um, typically what I do is I follow uh, or I will Google um, the guest um, before they come on the broadcast, just to see what some of their recent work is. And he wrote an article in 2016 uh, for some paper, and it's from Crossing, I just called Crossing Genres. And uh, I'll read the paragraph real quick. And it says, it's from Robert Jensen, his art, he wrote this, and it says, I quote, the United States will likely will likely always be a white supremacist nation because we have neither the intellectual nor moral traditions to deal with these harsh realities. As a country, we are intellectually lazy and morally weak. But when I've noticed that this is really a pattern for all professors that are classified as white when they come on the cows, whenever people say it's a country or they say it's American, they're talking about white people. They're not talking about black people. They're not talking about whatever people of color are, or black or brown, they're talking about white people. 
and listening also this morning to Gus's exchange at that tacky event that he went to with the Kumbaya, I think it was recently, um, and uh, the small conference where you were another uh, Kyle's listener were there, and just that interaction you had with that 16-year-old person. What I really wanted to ask him was basically on that paragraph that you just wrote in this article in 2016, it sounds like what you mean is that white people are not going to stop practicing racism. I think that he would have probably given us a million, million words, but that's what it all comes down to. I highly suspect he's practiced racism, and that's what a lot of these white professors like to use is just that jargon to kind of fool people with just saying, hey, a.k.a., we as white people are not going to stop practicing racism at all, and we like to just use big words to continue to make money off of racism but to confuse this victim as well. Thanks, Gus, and I'll meet my line. Fascinating. Yeah, I have not read that report, and I do agree with that tendency. Generally, whites, when they say uh, Americans or use the kind of vague we, they're talking about whites. They're not talking about uh, black people. Uh, so, yeah, and uh, that's been my experience. Whites, they do not just because that makes it flagrant. Uh, we, I, are not going to stop practicing racism ever that's just you know what it's a way of life you know i mean to just make it plain they're not going to do that i had the buckets of words uh sound effect ready to roll but i was kind of toggling back and forth looking at the switchboard because i was trying to you know accommodate if people had got hands up earlier i would have stopped my questions a little bit sooner and went to the phone lines but people were kind of late uh getting to the hands occupied and you know other things they had to do uh, other folks, any any other uh, comments that folks had, uh, things that stood out from Dr. Jensen or just things that you wanted to get in about the uh, bombings? I think folks, folks are all satisfied, as I said, uh, with the bombings, I think. Uh, very uh, serious, something that people should take some time to investigate. I tried to uh, check local news. I mean, there are uh, articles, the New Yorker, they had a piece today uh, where they were talking about it and, you know, they're updating the police uh, in Austin. They're giving uh, press conferences and what have you within the last 24 hours where they were talking about some of the uh, things that they said where they, you know, accused the first victim, uh, Mr. House uh, 39. They accused him of uh, being possibly connected with drugs. And maybe that's, you know, why it had something to do. They, you know, acknowledged that they could have done better, could have could have spoken better and maybe shouldn't have said that uh, at a press conference. But uh, I would encourage folks to uh, continue to monitor uh, this situation. I know Dr. Francis Cress Welsing, she would encourage us, hey, get those newspapers. She said that in the audio segment, get those newspapers or go online, uh, check out uh, KUT. Uh, that's the Austin uh, NPR uh, affiliate. So you can go there and they have a whole uh, section. It's a tab, Austin bombing. You can go there and you can see the updates. They have daily updates and they have a, a timeline. So you can see how everything unfolded uh, in the month uh, of March to just, you know, make that a part of your research, make that a part of your analysis. Uh, what happened uh, with this case, how this fits uh, within the larger context of white supremacy, racism. Uh, and and I think this is one where you can appreciate the way that I look at, uh, like when people talk about gratitude or appreciation, Dr. Frances Cress Welsing, that was one at uh, from the Welsing Institute. That was from one of her last lectures, December 2015, uh, the audio segment that we played at the beginning of the program where she talked about end stage white supremacy. That's what she thought this was, this period. Trump would be elected and, you know, the terrorism against black people, white terrorism uh, against black people. Uh, if, you know, the folks we who say we have some regard for Dr. Welsing, her work, uh, her life, the black self-respect that she exuded for decades, a plot like really think about that uh that entire <clears throat> excuse me that entire uh lecture is available so you can go back you can listen to it it's in the cows archives should be on youtube as well but you can go back and listen to that entire lecture uh and just study uh and get a really deep understanding for what she thought you know was going to be happening in this time period and then 
apply that, not just the mm hmm, mm hmm, that Dr. Welsing sure was cool, but really apply that to, you know, how we think, speak, act, uh, and come up with thoughts, concepts for, you know, how to solve this problem right now. I think that's what she would want. And I think definitely to keep that in mind, in stage white supremacy with regards to increased direct white violence, to really keep that in mind. Uh, constantly uh, when you're around whites. I know that can be difficult, but to really, you know, to be mindful uh, of that and to, to not minimize that, uh, to take that seriously. That's something Dr. Welsing encouraged on a constant basis. Uh, we'll check in again. Folks, any, any other commentary folks want to make sure they get in? Dr. Jensen, the bombings, uh, any other relevant info folks want to make sure they share? We all assume folks are all satisfied. Again, we should be here uh, by 24 hours from now, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific, workplace racism. Uh, we'll be looking forward if folks have uh, thoughts, suggestions, ideas uh, on what to do to neutralize racism, white supremacy in the workplace uh, and the book study on Friday, compensatory call in uh, this coming Saturday, uh, being pretty active as we move into spring 2018. Uh, if you have questions, guest suggestions, uh, gripes, thoughts, if you can't find something in the archives, drop an email uh, until justice at gmail dot com until justice at gmail dot com. Let me know and uh, we will try to respond promptly uh, with regards to the bombings. We should have a black female on the program also from the Austin, Texas area. When we had Dr. Martin Kevorkian on the program, who is also at the University of Texas, Austin, I think uh, we've had a number of professors from that institution on the program over the years, but he recommended uh, that we get Simone Brown, a uh, black female on the program. She wrote the book uh, Dark Matters, uh, which is about the surveillance, the historic surveillance of black bodies in the system of white supremacy. She talks about uh, the different ways that that technology has uh, refined, that process and technology has been refined over the years of terrorizing and surveilling uh, black bodies. Uh, but that's what her research is about. And specifically to talk about that book within the context of the Austin bombings, uh, but I'm really looking forward. I know Dr. Kevorkian, uh, admitted white supremacist, Dr. Kevorkian did rave about her book. He has recommended some pretty good books before that had great info about white supremacy racism. So I uh, have her book. I'm looking forward to reading it. If any, again, uh, Simone Brown, reading is more important than watching television, reading and writing. Simone Brown with an E on the end, uh, Simone Brown, Dark Matters, a black female. She's a professor at the University of Texas, Austin, and she should be hanging out with us uh, within the next few days or so uh, to, again, talk about her work. Austin bombings on the grind. Uh, oh, uh, the person that dialed in uh, on the free HD line. Did you have commentary, question, gripe? Line should be open. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's me, Gus, uh, HV, formerly HV Ivy now. Um, so I'm calling in so late, as I said before, I try to call in last hour because these races are charging me. Can I be heard? Yes, ma'am. Okay, because I said all that. Well, greetings, Gus, and greetings to everyone on the line. <sighs> Man, Dr. Jensen, he is such a racist, and he is just, just like everybody said, and he's just so dedicated, like he... First of all, you you asked him if we're in, if we are in increasing danger of uh, white terrorism, and he just used so many buckets of words and uh, did not answer your question. Um, in my view, um, he just kind of went all around it and just kind of kind of hem and hawed around, you know, the answer instead of just you know saying yes and kind of giving all of these examples that sort of point to it, but he didn't want to just you know straight out say it. And the conflation, like you said, uh, with the uh, the so-called sexism and the rest of it, and um, just like you said, like his 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 trouble with the which he didn't have it tonight, but you know his trouble with the the term dedication that just shows his dedication to white supremacy, and he was very very um, 
careful about the things that he said and the, the language that he used. Um, it was just like you said with the missteps. He was using a lot of, you know, language like that. And he didn't want to, he didn't want to use like the most accurate terms. And he kept like making excuses and, and saying stupid stuff in my view. Like, you know, we got all this progress and all this stuff about this progress in, in, in Austin and all of this and, just making all these excuses for these cops and all these people and, and like, um, just, like, defending them and defending their behavior and all of that. And then it's, it's, there's one thing that I, that I watch out for a lot of times is when you ask, when you and even when Justice, when she was on the, on the program, when you guys ask um, what – can be done, like you were even asking him, what can well-meaning whites do, and this, that, and the other, and he talked about all this stuff about um, conversation and all this stuff, you know, we've been talking, like, from the beginning, it's like, <laughs> you know what, what would you suggest if your children were subjected to what black people and other non-white people are subjected to, all of this murder and this medical apartheid and all of these acts of terrorism, what would you do? Would you be worried about sitting up here doing all this talking? No, and that's not how white people operate. When they are in imminent danger or any other, any other kind of danger, they go to war and they go and they do, you know, what they got to do to get the, the problems solved. Like they're not going to sit here and talk about we're going to have a, a, a conversation and a training and a this and a that. So it's like they don't never offer no real solutions, which again speaks to their um, their dedication to uh, white supremacy, and that's something that I noticed from him. I have so much more on my heart about this about this man and about you know even the bombings and a, and a lot of that stuff. But I've I've already talked almost five minutes. I don't want to talk like ten minutes straight or anything. But you know, um, thanks for everybody for listening, and, and thanks Gus for uh, taking my call. And I'll mute my line. Let's see. Give us give us one more thing that was on your heart about suspected race soldier, Dr. Jensen. Um, oh, man. Um, OK. OK. Like, especially the, the, the conflation thing. Right. OK. You say that there is a system of what. Oh, that's all. Oh, it's a couple of things. OK. You say there's a system of white supremacy. Well, why would you do all this? conflation if you admit there's a system of white supremacy because just the title itself implies supremacy. So if that's supreme, why are we going with all of this other stuff? This man to me, okay, let me ask you a question, Gus, if I, if I may. I know he's a doctor and he's a professor at a college or something. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and he has this book where he talks about, you know, the he says, you know, the problem is white people. Does he teach like a uh, so-called African-American studies or something about racism as, as his profession, as a, being a professor? I'm going to go to his faculty page at the University of Austin so we can see exactly what he teaches. Let's see. Uh, oh, there it is. Okay. University of Texas, Austin. Uh, Robert Jensen's faculty page. So he's in the School of Journalism and he teaches graduate and undergraduate programs. Undergraduate programs. Uh, does it list? It doesn't list. Oh, wait a minute. Does it offer... I just want to see if it has the exact titles of his courses listed. This is not it. It might take a second. If you want to go ahead with your commentary, then I can give you his exact courses. Okay. I mean, and you don't you don't have to because um, I guess the point that I'm making is that one thing I notice about him is he talks about racism a lot, and you know, just even a. Uh, one of the callers, I think the one who spoke right before me, talked about an article that he wrote, you know, about racism. He, to me, he, he strikes me as, one, a person who is dedicated to the system and what he wants to do is he wants to, he wants to confuse in the way that he, he talks about the situation. And also he wants to be a person that is pretending to um, be doing something about racism. 
which reduces, again, the victims doing something about it, if we got white people doing something about it. And also, to me, he, he just kind of strikes me as a hustler, like he's doing this for money because he doesn't have the real motive of wanting to end white supremacy. So he just really strikes me as a, as a hustler. And, he, and he's saying, like I said, stupid stuff talking about, oh, we don't really know motives because of this reason and that reason or whatever. Well, if the bomber doesn't know the victims, why in the world would he bomb them? We're in a system of white supremacy. We got white people bombing black people who they don't even know, and we don't know the motives. Like, what are you talking about? And, and the defense he was given toward the, 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 the propaganda and the racism that was being put, put out there about these people, were, oh, the victims were on drugs or they did it themselves and, you know, just all this nonsense. So it's just like this man. And I actually, I had a question. Can I ask you a question, Gus? I reckon. Okay. I said uh, on a previous broadcast, the, like the last one we had, uh, or just recently, I said, that, I said that women are not subject to men. They're subject to white men. And the thing that I noticed is that if, if a person says something like that, white people will try to take that and try to say that white men are, they'll try to take that and say that white men are trying to force them to practice racism. Well, my thing with that is this. I'm subject to white men, however, and, and white women. However, they're not forcing me to go and eat out. So that doesn't mean that they force me. They could, but that doesn't mean that they do, that they force me to do everything I do. So even white women, if you're subject to white men, that doesn't mean that they're forcing you to practice racism. And in my view, why I would say they're subject to them is because they rape them and they rape their children and they get 30 days and they get 90 days. And what are these women going to do about it? Apparently nothing because that's what it is and it's still like that and I'm pretty sure they don't like that. That being said, that doesn't mean they're forcing you to practice racism. And the evidence shows that they absolutely are not forcing you to practice racism. And what you do when you want to practice racism is you go to them to help you. If you want to get a black man lynched, you go and you say, we'll lynch him. And then the lie that's put out there is that he raped you. Or if you want to drag, literally drag, a black child down the hall of a school, literally do that. What you do is you go to, you don't go to the women because they're not in charge. You go to the men. They are the ones who are the CEOs and the this and the that. You might be the vice president, but you are not, you know, like the main person in charge. You go to them to, to make sure that you can do this and there's no consequences behind it. So you all, you're always recruiting men who you say is, is making you practice racism to, to help you to practice racism. So my question to you, Gus, is, th is that do you believe, and if not, why, can it be that white women are subject to white men just like the rest of us, but at the same time, they're still not being forced to practice racism, that those two facts can, co can coexist? Uh, well, I'm, I, it... Theoret to answer your question, uh, theoretically, yes, those facts could exist, but I have taken the position that white women are not subject to white men in the system of white supremacy. I have taken the position that they are, they are equal partners. Uh, now, absolutely, white men do mistreat white women. Absolutely, there's a lot of evidence of that, but whites mistreat whites all the time. Uh, white women talk about all the time how they cannot stand other white women. Uh, white men mistreat and fight other white men all the time. Brag about it. Sometimes make movies, movies about it. Fight Club. Uh, but at the end, they are united uh, as a team. You couldn't have a system of white supremacy if white men and white women were not uh, united and working together to make, you know, all of this work. And I have taken the position, as I think a few others, that uh, this is not a patriarchy at all, that this is a matriarchy. But that's, you know, neither here nor there. We've talked about that before. Uh, I've talked uh, and hopefully heavily emphasized the 
monumental role that white women play. But that notwithstanding, to answer your question, uh, you post, could it be possibly that white women are subject to white men, but still not being forced to practice racism, white supremacy, that they're just going along with that because they enjoy all the goodies of it, even though they have to deal with whatever they put up with with white men? Absolutely, that could be the case. They are still not uh, allies. They are not functioning as well-meaning whites to non-white people. So they are race soldiers and, you know, the problem. Did that answer the question? Yes, can I respond? Yes, ma'am. Um, I want to also make clear that in in my view, in, in film, it's, it's so interesting because on the one hand, it does seem like they're not subject to them because, you know, they're just not forcing them to do a lot of stuff. But then on the other hand, it just seems like they do things to them that they cannot do anything about, that any sane person would not like to be done to them. They would not like for them to be raped and then the person gets 30 days or 90 days or no days, just probation or whatever, and the same thing with their children. So things like that kind of makes me feel like they are, they are subject to them, but at the same time, still very complicit, just as, much as, just as much of a race soldier, not just going along with racism, but practicing racism side by side with them, a team in the practice of racism, at the same time having a, a lesser power differential, um, with a, a lesser power dynamic, I think is the way you say it, uh, uh, with them. So, like, what do you think about that? You know, that that could be, I think, white men and white women, whites, period, you know, regardless, I think they grapple amongst themselves uh, for power uh, on the plantation. Who's going to be in control of the niggers? Who's going to have more authority uh, over the niggers? That happens all the time. And, you know, some have submitted that what we're seeing right now with the whole uh, Me Too and everything is uh, an adjustment. Uh, white women uh, seeking or obtaining more authority in the system of white supremacy. That could be. Uh, but again, uh, whites, they, although they might fight amongst themselves for power and fight and abuse themselves, which, you know, absolutely does happen at the end of the day, they put all those squabbles or at least they do not allow those squabbles to disrupt their collective dedication to white supremacy. So, you know, I, like I said, I've already come to my conclusion about white women and their role. So, you know, I don't spend a whole lot of time uh, on that. But, you know, at the end of the day, race soldier, I just make sure that that's the key component that I keep in mind and to not get uh, sidetracked. When people like Dr. Jensen come along and are saying, you know, that's patriarchy and white women are victims, I make sure that I don't get confused about their their status and their relationship to me as a victim of white supremacy. Okay, can I say one more quick thing that has nothing to do with this? Let's hear it. Okay. Well, I want to quickly say that, you know, I, I totally agree with everything that you uh, just said, absolutely. And I would love to hear, you know, in the future just your, 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 your perspective on, you know, the matriarchy because I find that um, very, very interesting because I'm still even grappling with this whole issue of their subjugation or lack of subjugation. But the other thing I wanted to say is that I think the most, uh, well, for me at least, the, the thing that sticks out the most about you doing this program for nine years is the, the most impressive thing, and, and in my view, something to celebrate, you will probably disagree, is the endurance that you have had because of the obstacles that you have faced to where you have gotten you know, taken off the air so many times. You even got your MacBook Pro and still, if I'm not mistaken, got taken off the air. After that, you've had guests after they've seen that you are not going to back down from these white people. You've had guests that um, you've had them to, to remake. You've had them to just outright decline, like Robin D'Angelo, which I really wanted to have her on the show and have her on the program and have you, you know, talk to her. People have heard, you know, programs where you just, you try to speak as, as accurately and, and, and have motivated the callers to speak as accurately about racism as possible, and that has, you know, caused you some problems. Not only that, but I'm sure a lot of things that have taken place 
that you haven't even spoken about, that you haven't even told us about, and you have overcome all this stuff over nine years, and you did not let these white people make you quit. So I congratulate you for that, and I just want to say again that it's just, I think it's just remarkable, I said it before, for you to have this program for nine years, if for no other reason than all the, the obstacles that you have overcome and continue to overcome. And uh, I mean, my line, thanks for uh, taking my call and letting me say all that for so long. Appreciate it, Ivy. Hopefully we will not have to do 10 years. Uh, that is the goal to try to hopefully contribute to getting this problem solved uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, and if anything, to, I guess keep that in mind for all of us who are, I guess, listening to this program, uh, attempting to counter racism, white supremacy, that uh, there, if, if you are even stumbling in the correct direction uh, with regards to trying to use logic to solve this problem, uh, expect massive opposition uh, from racist man, racist woman racist child uh massive op they're talking about the 50 year anniversary of the assassination of uh dr king right now that's what you can expect uh all sorts of sabotage and terrorism and violence and trouble and mischief uh if you know you're trying to put because i mean you're trying to put them out of business so expect that and in fact use that as a symbol that you might be doing something correct so just think of that. Uh, and again, all of this is just about getting this problem solved as quickly as possible. And I think not following the path of Dr. Jensen uh, and the buckets of words and not being uh, as accurate as we can uh, with how we respond and, and give questions and how we talk about this problem, how we conceptualize and articulate white supremacy racism that right there is a part of why we don't get this problem solved. And also want to make sure I say from that article that uh, the caller read that Dr. Jensen wrote that white supremacy, this will always, I think it was said, uh, Dr. Jensen wrote something to the effect of this will always be a white supremacist country. Uh, that number one, he didn't say white people are dedicated to white supremacy racism, that they'll always practice racism. That, in my view, much more accurate would have been much more uh, constructive, but also... I've said before, very dangerous, that idea. I think that supports racism, white supremacy itself, people talking forever. It's always going to be white supremacy racism. False. Dr. Welsing would totally disagree. This problem can and will be solved, and we can solve this problem quickly. Uh, that's just that right there uh, is a part of racism. I just was talking about that. Believing that this problem can be solved. That is huge. Believing that this problem can be solved. There would be no reason for Dr. Jensen to write any of these books. No reason for this program. We could all be, you know, eating ice cream or find whatever, you know, sedative will help us deal with the plantation. Get, you know, the strongest drugs we can possibly get or whatever other narcotics and, you know, forget all this. We can find something else to do with our time if this problem cannot be solved. That's not the position that I've taken, and they would not be sabotaging Gus T. Renegade and my little ragtag outfit here. Uh, they would not have subjected Dr. King to that Cointel Pro program and everything else that he and Coretta Scott King endured during their lives if this problem could not be solved. That's just, you know, following drunk logic, in my opinion. Why would you, you know, have to waste time with retards like myself if this problem could not be solved? Just make sure I emphasize that problem can be solved. Problem can be solved. The problem, racism, white supremacy can be solved. Whites can be put out of business. We can do it. Dr. Welsing absolutely believe. Folks don't remember anything else. Dr. Welsing fervently believed that whites can be put out of business. We can do it. That is our cosmic duty. Folks satisfied? Anything else we need to get in or are uh, we set to call it a broadcast? Um, yes, um, this doesn't have nothing to do with, uh, the Austin bombing or Dr. Jensen. Um, this is just, uh, um, an observation that I made of, um, terms of words that my, um, my mate, my wife, um, uses that I kind of disagree upon and I want to know if I'm correct on trying to correct her 
with this term and the term, the, you know, she likes to say it's not racism, it's a system, it's a system of racism. And um, in my opinion, my observation, when you use the term, you know, a system, it may, it takes the human element out of it. You know, it's kind of saying like, hey, it's just a system. It doesn't, it's not, it's not people actively going out here doing it. So what I, you know, respond to her is with, okay, is this a system or is this a system or is this a system of white supremacy? Who are the people running the system? Are you saying that the system is this, you know, because the system has to have people actively, you know, involved to, um, for it to function. And when she says it's, it's not, it's not racism. It's, it's, it's just, it kind of gives you know, it gives me the notion that she thinks that it's not, it's not white people out here actively harming and mistreating uh, people of color. I just want to know if I'm, you know, on the right path as far as my terminology with that type of language. Uh, my response would be. Uh, I because I think you started by saying uh, asking about correcting your wife. I think was the way that it was phrased. I yeah, I, I don't. I I do not uh, make an effort to correct or call myself correcting other non-white people. Like if we if folks who listen to the cows uh, have heard me, if people call in, I'll say now. Uh, on this broadcast, uh, we do not use the term fair, uh, and I don't look at that as a correction. That's just a code that I have uh, adapted for this broadcast. I don't want to promote uh, people listening to pick up you know, that term or white privilege. That's another one in the title of Dr. Jensen's uh, book. I just have codes about that. But I mean, if we're not on the program, uh, I don't tell people that I'm talking to, you know, you shouldn't use this term or don't talk this way. Or if you're talking to me, you can't use this. Like, I don't do that sort of thing. People can pick whatever terms that they want to use. If they ask for my thoughts or suggestions on it, I'll offer. Now that's it. I don't know if your wife uh, asked for suggestions on terms or maybe you all, you know, critique each other's language, which is great. Um, my view, uh, you know, she said what she said. Uh, I mean, you, I, I use both. I Sometimes I say racism. Sometimes I say system of white supremacy or system of racism. Uh, I do make a point, and it's in my definition when I say system. Uh, the system is whites, racist man, racist woman. Exactly as you stated, you can't have a system without having individuals classified as white operating that system. Systems don't work without people, and that needs to be, you know, emphasized because exactly as you said that people will say that a lot of times so that it does not directly indict any individual whites uh and i you know try to pick that out specifically uh and make sure that that doesn't happen when i use the term system but uh, i do say system of white supremacy i do think emphasizing that this is done in a systematic ma that white people do this they function collectively in a systematic manner to oppress black people absolutely i think it's important i think dr welsing emphasized in the audio clip we started with the importance of uh this being uh, articulated as systematic terrorism against uh black people uh just making sure that that gets emphasized i think you can do it either way if you're saying racism you can you can articulate it in that manner or if you're saying system of white supremacy racism you can articulate that it is people that are white people individuals classified as white who are driving directing dedicated to the operation of that terroristic system does that make sense um Yes, yes, it makes complete sense, and um, it, it it just we um we read the, um Nilly Fuller's book, and we, we we have discussions on you know certain suggestions that he has in the book, you know, and that that's all it is. I wouldn't like say I wouldn't say that I was trying to correct her in a sense. I just you know I just gave my opinion on when she used that word how I, how I take that you know like frame of that you know framing of that um that word how i take it mm. that's all and um can i ha can i um um tell you something else that i um observed let's hear it um yes yeah, so, um i was invited on a field trip with my daughter i have a five-year-old daughter she's in kindergarten and um 
I work a night shift, and um, it's hard for me to actually, you know, be very involved in her school or whatever. But uh, this time around, she, she asked me to come for the field trip. I, I agreed, and um, I took a day off, got in there early, and I was to my surprise that um, this is a predominantly black school that, you know, my daughter goes to. She's in kindergarten, and it's like, four kindergarten teachers. Out of the four kindergarten teachers, three of them were um especially, you know, female, um, white white white, you know, especially right racist female. And I just it kinda took me back to, but I, I didn't make no judgments because um I know um Billy Fuller actually talks about not every white person being a white supremacist. And, you know, so I just I just played it cool. So I just went in the class, sat in the back, observed the classroom. Now, this teacher, she had a um assistant. The assistant was a, a um a black female and um she was very hands on with, with my daughter and the other kids. The clip the, the class is full of, you know, full of black kids. Very uh, helpful. Helped them with the work, helped them with the, uh, you know, the physical work. But one thing that I, you know, observed is when it came to, like, okay, get in line or uh, come sit down or uh, more of the the direction of how the class was ran, it was more on the, the, um, the white female to give those directions. It wasn't really up to the black. Um, assistant, which she was actually, I felt like she was more hands-on, and I just found it odd that, you know, and you got in this all-black school that you have the majority of the the white teachers of the school are teaching kindergarten. Do you have any kind of um, like um, opinion on why, why is that, or, you know, how that frame, how, how is that, you know, is that, does that have anything to do with the system of white I'm sure it does. I don't know how many, you know, what the, the demographics of the teaching staff at the school are. Uh, if it's if it's mostly black children, I don't know if, if most of the other staff members are non-white and somehow these white teachers, white female teachers most, all in it. Yeah, most, most of the, the, the teachers are, are, are black and the, the school is white. 99% black. Oh, okay. It's only like white too. So I just find it kind of peculiar that the only white teachers all teach in kindergarten. You know, kids, the youngest kids at the school. I just find that kind of... I have no idea. It could be. I don't know the size. I know sometimes the same logic that they'll use with like a Tamir Rice or an Ayanna Stanley Jones when a black child is the victim of white terrorism or some form of anti-black violence. Uh, they'll say that black children are, you know, tend to, tend to be perceived as adults and significantly larger if these are smaller white women. I know sometimes I've been in school settings where they have white women that are smaller uh, and they will, you know, express concern about working with larger children if they're in an environment that has this high concentration of uh, melanated children. They might have just put them in the kindergarten classes so that they, you know, will feel safer since the kindergartners, I would presume, would be much smaller. Uh, so they wouldn't have any reason to, you know, fear that, oh, if I'm working with, you know, as opposed to if you're working with a 10 year old or an 11 year old, they might be closer to the same size. That might be a gander. I'm just speculating. Here, I don't know enough information about the environment, but that could be one reason that would, in my view, that would definitely relate to racism, white supremacy. But I don't know. Did you have a theory? Can I add on a, a question? Let's hear a retired firefighter. Yes. Uh, are are those uh, teachers, those white females, are they relatively young? Um. Yes. One is young. Um. But okay, that, well, it, 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 it may be a situation to whereas they being they're just getting into the school system uh, and they have a they have a metaphor for it, combat pay combat situation, meaning that you got to be with the niggers for a little while before you uh, finally get to your 
your uh, ultimate uh, dream destination like Marjorie uh, Douglas Senior High in Parkland, you know, something like that. Uh, you got to pay your dues, uh, so to speak. Uh, that that's one uh, one of the reasons on how you would see a lot of white uh, people, especially white females, uh, in areas where it's a lot of black students, or in a quote unquote area where black people uh, are allowed to stay at. Uh, that's been my experience uh, dealing uh, in, in the school system. How does that sound? That sound that that sounds like it might be the case because um, one of them was actually I was told that was um, you know teacher of the year one of the um, white females you know it like I said it just it just was a weird thing like she's piling up a resume she's piling up a resume and uh, eventually she's going to get to a Marjorie uh, Douglas. The reason why I mentioned, if you know, that's the, that's the high school where the, uh, the quote-unquote last mass shooting was at. Uh, it's considered to be very prestigious for a public school, uh, and I guarantee you the people that are there, they are veteran white teachers uh, who have been teaching for a long time in the public school system, and they, they uh, until that day anyway, were quite comfortable in their uh, in going to work. Yes, I, I most definitely um, I didn't take that into um, consideration. But you know, thanks for the, the commentary. Um, oh, the most important thing. And, um, hang, on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. The most important thing out of all of that, in my view. I do not, and I have talked with Mr. Fuller about it, and at the end of the day, he is a victim of racism. He has VGQ. I have VGQ. I do not agree, and it is extreme. In fact, I'm going to mute the line just because the noise is distracting me. Uh, I do not agree that uh, not all white people are not racist, and that is dangerous. In fact, I don't even like oof, want that stated on the program without making sure that that gets rebuffed every time because i think it's dangerous to think that way that this could possibly be a white person that is not racist i have seen where because of the programming because of how we have been brain trashed and the le the high levels of white validation that exist we are searching praying hoping yearning that we are friends with that one white person who is not racist ted here my pal my friend susan Helen, Richard, Nate is my buddy. He is not racist or whomever it is. No, the exact. I, and Mr. Fuller would say you should be thinking this person is probably racist. If this white person is able, they're probably racist. That's the way that Mr. Fuller says it. Uh, the way I say if they're classified as white racist, that's it. It's nothing else to think about. And again, all of this comes back to what does it mean to be white? In my view, it should never even enter your mind. This could be a white person that's not racist. That's not logical. I could be wrong. I'm just making a flat statement. And again, I've talked to Mr. Fuller about it. It's not beef, conflict, nothing of all. I understand the logic of why he says that, but I've just come to a flat conclusion. No, uh, that should be eliminated. I've just seen where that causes confusion and, and many, many victims. As I said, we are already trained to think that way anyway that there are whites who are not racist and i'm just saying it is flat and not true i've not found such a person if you find such an individual wow that would be the discovery of a lifetime those white ladies will use that experience of teaching quote unquote teaching your child to subvert counter racism any by any non-white person's attempts to counter racism they will come up with well i don't know what you're talking about i've worked with black children and i was quite successful at it at doing so you know that sort of thing uh they, they would use that they would use that they use it all the time the whole idea about some of my best friends are, are black or, you know that kind of stuff you know is very similar to that and they would use that experience they don't stay there long 
They don't stay there long. It, it'll be it'll be it'll be manned with another crop of white teachers to go through that process. Uh, in some cases, some thoughts of I have is is the is the deliberate uh, training process that they send them through. Uh, similar to, you know, any other job, you know, you're training somebody, you want to put them in kind of like worst case scenario situations uh, to, to so, so they would have that experience as they go through, uh, you know, hands-on type of training, you know, uh, from, you know, go, going from college to actually getting practical uh, 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 experience into the, uh, the job of teaching. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Uh, for sure. We're going to do 10 minutes and then wrap so everybody can get everything done in 10 minutes. I can look at the clock. And I just wanted the, the male caller uh, that is so awesome. I meant to say before to commend you and your uh, partner, Black Self Respect, uh, sharing, refining your counter racist codes. That is spectacular. Bravo uh, to you and your, your partner. Uh, and even when you go in, to be with your child, your daughter, thinking these are probably racists, these three race soldier white women, uh, you still, that doesn't mean that you go in, you know, being hostile or belligerent, you observe, do the, the same thing. You just use counter racist logic to operate in that situation, observe, ask questions, observe with suspicion. But yeah, you still want to go in. Uh, I, I wouldn't say be cool, quote unquote, but uh, be codified. Uh, Ivy, did you want to ask your question? Yes, yeah, so um, I could barely hear uh, the caller uh, that was talking about um, the these people who may or may not be racist. And the question that I had was, what is the what is what what is the the relevance of whether or not any of them? are racist given the fact that white people collectively wage war against black people. Like, what, I guess, are you hoping to accomplish if you discover that one of them or whatnot is not a racist? Uh, our caller who dialed in, Father, uh, I think his line might have dropped when he rings us back. If he's able to do so in the next 10 minutes, I'll open his line and we'll get his response to the question but uh, for anyone who's listened to the cows for the nine years that have that we've been on the air uh, that's not new my stance on there possibly being whites that are not racist we've had many programs where we've talked about this in detail uh, one that I reference regularly Zach Casey he was on the program in 2010 he was at the white privilege conference uh, in 2010 I met him in person and then he was on the program and we talked about that extensively uh, and in fact, his theory was the impossibility of positive white identity, meaning that there is no such thing as a individual classified as white who is not racist himself included uh, and he he talked about he came out chuckling at the white privilege conference in 2010 he came out chuckling saying that hearing a white person talk at one of those lectures for an hour only further reinforced his theory that there is no way you could be classified as white and not be racist uh just something I have emphasized and and really, really, after I have thought about this and again, just come to a conclusion. So I tell people you should think about, ask, come to your own conclusion. What does it mean to be white? Uh, and I think that's important because when we talk about solving this problem, this is something that I think will help speed up the process. Stop looking for whites that are not racist. Stop thinking they're whites that are not racist at minimum, the bare minimum. Mr. Fuller says, if this person is able, they're probably racist. That should be the bare minimum in my opinion. I mean, that's kind of low. It should be substantially higher. If they're white. That's all you need to know. Uh, don't see. Caller might have to respond another day. Uh, if he don't know if he had other issues, other things uh, happening, we'll give. He, he still has uh, six minutes to dial back in. So uh, any anything folks need to get in in the six minutes that we're giving him? Uh, any questions, comments? rebuffs, gripes. Could anyone else on the line who heard what he was saying, I guess, tell me what, why he even brought that up? Because it is like if the 
if you if you like the Nazis and you know the 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 people in Germany, it's like if you have some people over there who are not racist, like or who are not trying to kill them or whatever, you stay you stay away from them because they collectively are waging war against you. So I'm trying to understand like what 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 he, what he said in terms of the purpose of even caring whether or not any of them are racist because of, you know white people collectively are so. Well, I'm just, does anybody know what he was trying to accomplish or why that even mattered to him, I guess, if any of them wasn't racist? Don't know. That did come up with Zach Casey, admitted racist white supremacist. Uh, just my only quick speculation would be that's very common with victims of white supremacy. Sometimes it is more comforting to think that there are at least some, maybe a small number of whites who are not racist than to think that every single individual who is classified as white is a white supremacist racist. Uh, to think that way. And I think he said on the program to think that way would mean that I'm sending uh, my daughter, my son to racists uh, every day at school. I'm, I'm, you know, going to work with racists. I'm going to work. I'm going to the hospital and asking a racist to, you know, check on my health like that, that, you know, literally could drive you insane to think that way, uh, that as a non-white person, you know, you he could understand why you might really, really desperately want to believe that there have to be some whites who are not racist. That was his speculation. I can see the logic in that. And I, I've seen this pattern a lot where a lot of non-white people, that becomes something that they really, really hold on to tightly, dearly. Uh, and Dr. Bobby E. Wright, uh, the greatest pathology in the world is to believe in things just because we wish them to be so. Anybody else have comment they need to get in? Oh, we have our caller back. You can have three minutes, sir. Uh, thank you so much for dialing back in. The question that Ivy asked was, what was the significance or reason for you bringing up that these uh, white educators, white female educators, may not be racist, that not every white person is a racist. Why did you bring that up? What was the importance of that? Um, because I'm very sensitive around, with, especially when it comes to my kids, about them, you know, interacting with, with um, people that consider white. And, um, and it, like I said, I, I had no idea that her teacher, she's been at the school for almost the whole year, I had no idea that her teacher was um, a white female. If I would have known this earlier, maybe I would have, you know, considered moving her to a class where, you know, the teacher might be black. But I was just, I was just assuming that since the school is predominantly, you know, black school, the, the teachers that I have met in the past, they mostly was um, black. Um, I just, I just, it never just crossed my mind that they might have white teachers at school. I just found it very odd that all of them were teaching the same grade level. And but what does that have to do with them possibly not being racist? Oh, um, it was, it was just something that I, I keep in mind so I don't make a prejudgment per se. I don't know if that's code or not I don't you know I don't I know that um I tend to do that a lot and um you know my wife gets very kind of you know on edge when I go into situations already assuming that but I always revert back to you know compensatory code and saying that yes that's that's the that's the logical thing to do is to think that every you know white person I should suspect that the least of them being a racist, but um, but um, most definitely, if 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 from my observation, if I felt like if I was very uncomfortable with the way that you know the white teachers were interacting with the kids, maybe I would consider you know my child out of the class. That's one. Huh. I see. I I can only emphasize. Uh, Mr. Fuller would say. Again, if the white person is able to practice racism, you should assume, you should prejudge, 
Yes, they probably are racist. I'm very, very certain if you call Mr. Fuller, he would co-sign on that and say, yes, that's exactly what I've been saying for a long time. If the white person is able to practice racism, you should assume that they probably are racist. That is bedrock counter racist codification, according to Mr. Fuller. I would only say the prejudgment is all based on what does it mean to be white. Some of this can be fast forwarded once we come to an accurate conclusion about what it means to be classified as white. Ivy, did that answer your question? Did he answer your question? He did, and not only is it logical, but it's also the safest thing to assume to just, you know, stay away from these people because they they always war against us. And that's all. I'll meet my life. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. ProduceJustice.com, Mr. Fuller's uh, website, where you can get a copy of the code book and read exactly uh, what Mr. Fuller has to say. ProduceJustice.com. ProduceJustice.com. Neely Fuller Jr., victim of racism, white supremacy. That's it. Uh, thanks to all the folks who tuned in. Might be a good idea. I'm sure this is a lesson learned to check, investigate, to know who your child's instructors are early on. So that is not a rude awakening. That's one that you don't want to find out, you know, two, three, four weeks down the road. I'm sure our uh, caller would say, yeah, that's information I wish I had known earlier. I, I think he already said he would have maybe made some different decisions uh, with regards to his child's education. So, yeah, maybe that's one uh, a lesson we can apply to our counter racist code to take your child's education extraordinarily serious uh, and to make sure that you have lots of information about who's doing the teaching and what's going on. Stay informed. If anything changes, if there's a change in principal or educator or counselor or, you know, whatever is uh, happening, uh, make sure that you are very aware uh, and sharing that, you know, between parents or whomever is involved uh, in your child's education, your child's life. Uh, Very important education, uh, very important information information to have in okay. mind uh we are wrapping uh folks will have to uh catch us this weekend for the compensatory call in uh if it's just general or if it's something related to workplace racism you can just dial in tomorrow uh with that thanks all everyone for tuning in i hope it was a constructive investment of your thursday evening uh drop an email if you have a question guest suggestion recommendation thought gripe until justice at gmail.com uh also on twitter as well at until justice uh but you can drop an email until justice at gmail.com and let me know i think i'm still trying to catch up from some of the emails from uh the flood because now i have you know the new emails coming in and all that but at any rate uh drop a line if you have question comment can't find something in the archives uh, and definitely, I hope the broadcast was worthy of your time and energy this evening. Uh, with Oh, I have the article. I'll post that article that the caller mentioned. I'll put it on Facebook uh, so people can check it out. The article that Dr. Uh, Jensen uh, authored about white supremacy being permanent. Uh, with that, again, encourage sobriety would be best under conditions of white terrorism. Again, if folks, you know, have some sincere regard for what Dr. Welsing had to say, man, Apply her teaching. She for sure would want us to exude maximum black self-respect with regards to sobriety, especially under these conditions. If this is end stage white supremacy, race soldiers are mailing bombs, fire white race soldier firefighters are spitting on black children in public. All of these incidents happening on a regular basis. If that's the case, then we should really reflect serious counter racist codification in our behavior at all times. And in my view, that would for sure mean I am going to be sober so I can be alert and thinking clearly, paying attention to what's happening around me so I can be mindful, not surprised. Never know when I might need to might need to make a decision to save my life or the life of my children or, you know, whomever else. At any rate, especially if you're in a vehicle, you should for sure be sober. You never know. Daniel Holtzclaw 
might be pulling you over. You certainly might have to make life-saving decisions. Being under the influence will not help you solve problems in those situations. Uh, If you're going to be driving, uh, certainly uh, you want to buckle up. Matter of fact, if you're going to be in a vehicle driver or passenger, buckle up. Let's do everything we can to minimize contact with race soldiers, badge or no. That said, creator, we ask that you help us remain patient with other black people, victims of white supremacy. We ask that you help us remain patient with ourselves. Remind us to demonstrate the highest levels of black self-respect at all times, in all places, each and every time we are in contact with another black person. It has been time. Replace white supremacy with justice immediately. Cow signing out. Thanks all for tuning in. Nigga, you so brainwashed. I'm a victim, What's your brother. Problem? You're a victim. Right. I'm a up. victim of 400 years of conditioning. Shut up. The man has programmed my conditioning. Mm-hmm. Even my conditioning has been conditioned. Uh.